Why do people like this game so much from your point? Uh, the things we hear, the buzzwords we hear are this. It's entertaining, it's fast-paced, it's fun, and it's different than the National Football League. We're not coming out and trying to compete with the NFL. We're not trying to come out and clone the National Football League or be an imitation of the NFL. We're our own game. We're apples and oranges to the outdoor game. And that's exactly what we want to be, and that's what we want the public to perceive it as. Because it is a different game. It's still football. The chemistry's there. They're still down there knocking each other around, throwing the ball, catching it, having a lot of fun playing football. But it's a different game, and that's the way arena football was meant to be. Arena ball is fun, it's entertaining, and it's not a clone to the National Football League. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hello, everybody. How are you? Happy New Year. Welcome to 2018. Good Seats Still Available style. Yes, it's that curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. We are back for another fun-filled year, hopefully a full year this time of uh, excitement my name is Tim Hanlon. I appreciate you finding us uh, in your little podcast uh, search for stuff that uh, hopefully might be interesting for you. And uh, we do hope that this week's episode uh, is uh, indeed in that category. Uh, we're going back to football and uh, the indoor variety for the first time in our in our little journey together. Uh, and uh, a, a very special guest uh, in that pursuit. His name is Jim Foster. He is the uh, founder uh, and the uh, uh, longtime uh, commissioner and frankly, this the uh, originator, the inventor of the sport of arena football and the Arena Football League. And we have a very uh, deep and uh, uh, detailed conversation uh, with Jim about uh, the earliest days uh, of the Arena Football League and frankly, the days prior to that, uh, uh, the formation of such. Uh, we get into uh, his roots, uh, helping. Uh, uh, get pro football kind of off the ground in the home state of Iowa, uh, his uh, travails in uh, semi-pro football, uh, bringing kind of the first uh, exhibition, if you will, of American football into uh, into Europe, uh, which obviously led to bigger things uh, on a professional level too with the World League of American Football, et cetera. Uh, his uh, early days in the NFL, uh, the uh, ill-fated or not ill-fated, actually the, uh, the interesting uh, date that we've referenced in a couple of other episodes uh, in 1981, the MISL Indoor Soccer All-Star Game at Madison Square Garden, which uh, conveniently for our conversation was the actual birthplace of the Arena Football League. We'll get into some of those details uh, with Jim. Uh, we'll also talk about his days in the USFL, which uh, got him uh, his true professional football chops and uh, kind of convinced him to get going uh, in earnest to launch uh, the American, excuse me, the Arena Football League, the AFL also as it's known. That's why I got confused. Uh, arena football would not be possible, would not exist uh, without the efforts and the pioneering spirit of Jim Foster. It's interesting, too, because obviously arena football, as we record this, seems to be, you know, t teetering just a bit. Uh, it's I think we're down now to four teams, two of which are owned by uh, Ted Leonsis's uh, uh Outfit out of Washington. He owns both the Washington and the Baltimore franchises. Obviously, the Philadelphia Soul are the defending champions, but the defending uh, Arena Bowl competitors or runners up, the Tampa Bay Storm, just recently folded operations. And it looks like Cleveland, the Gladiators, are going to take a two year sabbatical while they get their uh, arena uh, uh, redone. Uh, so it's uh, not looking particularly great for uh, the Arena League right now, but. Um, we're going to get into some of those issues a little later on in our conversations to what possibly uh, could make the Arena Football League uh, stronger and better than ever going forward. Uh, this from the uh, originator, the founder, uh, the entrepreneur behind it all, uh, the person by the name of Jim Foster. And he is our guest. Uh, and uh, we're going to get to that conversation in just a couple of seconds. So hang tight for that. I think you will enjoy it immensely. Um, again, welcome to 2018, our uh, sponsorship uh, continues from our friends at uh, Audible. Again, that's uh, audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Uh, if you go there, you will get a free 30-day uh, trial of the service, and you also get a free audiobook download from the over 180,000 titles to choose from uh, in audiobook land from our friends at Audible. And again, that's audibletrial.com slash goodseats for your free 30-day trial and free audiobook download. Give them a try. What a great way to sort of uh, make a New Year's resolution to read slash listen to more books. That's a great way to do it. And another great thing to do is, of course, go to our other sponsors and friends 
at sportshistorycollectibles.com. Yes, sportshistorycollectibles.com uh, is the place for you to find all kinds of things from leagues, uh, current and former, in all the sports that you know and love in professional sports. Uh, that'd be football or baseball or soccer or tennis even. You name it, uh, that uh, sportshistorycollectibles.com probably has that uh, piece of curiosity uh, that you've been lusting after or frankly didn't know you needed. Sportshistorycollectibles.com. Use the promo code GOODSEATS and get 15% off your entire purchase uh, when you use the promo code good seats, and that's at our friends at sportshistorycollectibles.com. Thank you to Dean Mitchell, the proprietor of said site, and uh, we look forward to more promotional stuff coming up. Keep a listen out for that. Okay, we've gotten that out of the way. We, uh, again, appreciate you finding us, and let us get to our extensive, detailed, and really, really interesting conversation with the founder of the Arena Football League, Jim Foster, coming up. So you were uh, you were you're an Iowa guy, right? And uh, coming out of college, or maybe even during college, you kind of you were hit, hit by the football bug, I guess, and that uh, became sort of your career uh, right out of college, right? Maybe you want to start there and sort of give our audience a bit of a well. I got hit by the football bug when I was born because my father uh, was a former Iowa Hawkeye football player. He came right out of the end of World War II uh, instead of going to Japan for the conventional invasion. Thank God Harry Truman tried, President Truman decided to drop the bomb because uh, about two weeks before they did it, they notified a lot of guys like my dad that they were on furlough until further notice. And uh, when the bomb was dropped, they were told, we don't need you. And he went right over to the University of Iowa Athletic Offices, which had recruited him in a, a year earlier before he went into uh, basic training at a class of 44, which many people don't know is the last year that if you were in the class of 44 for World War II, you were going. I'm you couldn't walk straight or see. And uh, he was in that class. But fortunately, he was able to play football at Iowa uh, until a back injury from some World War II training acted, acted up a little bit his uh, sophomore year and short in his career. But that, I grew up with my dad in Iowa City. Uh, he was very involved with the football program at Iowa. So from a young age, whether I was meant to be a football player or not, I thought I was going to be a football player. And that went on until my junior high school when I found out that I was actually a pretty good distance runner. <laughs> and uh, as I've said for many years, I was, a, I was a football player mentality trapped in a distance, player, distance runner's body. Uh, and I ended up not playing football my senior year, but running cross country and, and did pretty well at a state meet and ended up uh, running at the University of Iowa. Uh, and honestly, I kind of fell into that because I was not good enough to be recruited by Iowa. But in February 1st of that year, right after a recruiting trip to Drake University, which I had some interest in going to because they had a good broadcast journalism school and a good track program, I unfortunately hit a car with a motorcycle. Uh, on a warm winter day when I shouldn't have probably been on it, but I was, and I shattered my right ankle. Uh, they thought I was done running for good, and uh, I rehabbed about eight months later and ended up just going to the University of Iowa in Iowa City where I grew up, and the track coach there uh, was a legendary coach and runner at Iowa was nice enough to let me come out and hang around with the team and try to get in shape. And I eventually did make the team. And I wasn't a great runner at Iowa. I lettered and I scored some points. But it was a great opportunity for me to, to be in college athletics. And I honestly think had that not happened, I'm not sure that I ever would have gone on in sports. But I uh, ended up getting quite a bit larger. Uh, I went from my skinny track body to being about 180 pounds and six foot two from being five ten and one forty by the time I was a senior and I ended up getting a tryout with a former Minnesota Viking uh, farm team in Des Moines, Iowa because I got a job nearby right out of college and I made that team as a backup wide receiver and special teams player and this was the last year that the NFL had any remnants of its farm team system left and the, the Vikings we wore Viking uniforms in fact my helmet had Joe Cap's name in it <laughs> And that's how I got started in football, and uh, it went from there. What, what what was the name of that league, and then how did that get you to the team that you ultimately, or the league you ultimately helped get to uh, Europe as uh, as an exhibition? Uh, that was a, the Midwest Pro Football League, and it was actually at one time tied into the Continental Football League. Uh, back sure. A lot of people don't know this either, but back in the late 50s and the early 60s, uh, really till the late 60s, 
there was some pretty successful minor league football in this country. And uh, there was a book written called The Forgettables about the Pottstown Firebirds that uh, uh, Bobby Tucker played for. Uh, not Bobby Tucker. Uh, I'm going to forget the guy's name. He was a really good quarterback uh, that uh, had a few uh, ins and outs in the NFL. Bobby Tucker did play for the Lowell Massachusetts Giants and went on to be a Hall of Fame uh, player in the NFL. There were Otis Sistrunk was another one. In fact, I was enshrined in the Minor League Pro Football Hall of Fame in the class of 82 with Otis Sistrunk, if you remember that name. Sure. From, from the University of Mars, he used to say, because he didn't play college football and was with Oakland Raiders and was a great player. Uh, Bobby Tucker, who was primarily with the New York Giants, and the quarterback, whose name I can't think of right now, who played for the Pottstown Firebirds and was, an, I think, an All-American at Maryland, but he was about five foot ten, and that was his problem. But he was a prolific thrower. That that at that before television really took off with the NFL uh, in college football, there was a niche for minor league pro football, and they played in places like Lowell, Massachusetts, and Bridgeport, Connecticut, because I actually played several games out east for the Bridgeport Buccaneers, which had been the Bridgeport Jets when they were had farm team alignments. And that was some years after I came out of Iowa, and I ended up uh, working in the Des Moines area, and they had a team called the uh, Des Moines Vikings, and they played at uh, where the Iowa Cubs, the AAA baseball team plays, and it was a baseball stadium. Never dreamed I was going to get to play football again, and I actually on a whim almost, a call just to find out more about them. And, they, and a guy answered the phone and said, were you, were you looking for a tryout? And I said, well, I'm just trying to find out a little bit about it. He said, what are you playing? I said, well, I'd be a wide receiver in special teams. He said, boy, we're short there. We had two guys get hurt against the Omaha Mustangs last Saturday night, which was a team that was aligned with the Kansas City Chiefs at the time. So I got a tryout. I made the team, and I was absolutely elated. And I played a week later uh, in a game uh, – in Sac Taylor Stadium, uh, and I caught a pass for a first down late in the second quarter, and I got drilled. Uh, in fact, I got hit so hard my helmet was on sideways. And I got up, and I was in front of the, our bench and the coach, and he looked at me and said, Son, welcome to pro football. <laughs> I'll never forget that. <laughs> And I loved every minute of it. I, I scored a few touchdowns here and there. I wasn't a great player, but God, it was a great opportunity, and it set me up for things to come, which was the fact that a year at the end of that season, there were no more farm teams in the NFL. It was done. There had been player stashings, and they were losing money on them. And, in fact, several years later, I got an interview with the Minnesota Vikings for a potential marketing job, and Max Winter, uh, primary owner, came in to visit with me because he saw on the resume that I had been with the Des Moines Vikings and he had some stories to tell. And he, and he said they really wanted to get out of it, the whole NFL, because it was just becoming an expensive drain and they didn't feel like they were, it was efficient in developing talent the way they wanted to. It had been at one point, but it was, there was just too many problems. So they decided to just get rid of it and they didn't do anything until uh, they came along with the World League of American Football you know, in the 1990s. So what happened was there was no place for a lot of guys to play. Uh, I happened to be the advertising manager of the Maytag company, the old Lonely Repairman's product, uh, which was based just outside Des Moines and Newton. Sure. Was, and, that during, was that during the Gordon Jump years, or was it somebody else uh, as the uh, No, Lonely it was, uh, oh, God, what was his name? Last name was White. He was an old-time Baltimore comedian. Jesse White. There you go. Oh, oh God, I could, I could spend a half an hour telling you stories about how to take care of him and do commercials with him, and him having too many drinks at dinner and then not being able to finish the shoot. Oh, he was something else. He was, he was, a, he was one of the old school guys like Maury Amsterdam and all those guys. Shecky Green. He worked with all of them, and it was that was an experience in its own right for a young guy out of college. But we uh, didn't have anywhere to play, and some of the players knew I had some marketing background because actually during the season with the Vikings, I would stand on the sideline when I wasn't playing, critiquing on how they could improve, maybe can improve the, the, the attendance and do some more promotional things. And I had, I didn't know it, but I really had some capabilities in that area. I just hadn't realized it yet. And a couple of them remembered it and said, why don't you put a team together? And I was naive enough and young enough and, and, and enough piss and vinegar to say, okay, let's see what we can do. So I went out and tried to put a team together and uh, that would be on its own. And there was still a league around. It was kind of a remnant because a lot of the teams weren't playing anymore. But 
I was trying to do something in Des Moines and I didn't have a lot of connections there. I never really lived there or anything and I wasn't getting anywhere. And I happened to have lunch one day with a fellow in, in Newton, Iowa, which is just outside of uh, Des Moines, 20,000 people at the time, all the Maytag facilities were there. And, and, and this, I'm introduced to a fellow that owns a couple drug stores in town who had played college football. I didn't know at that point. And he said, Jim's trying to put a football team together in Des Moines. And he looked at me and he said, well, why wouldn't you put it together in Newton? And I said, why would I do it here? And he said, because it's not as big and we have nothing to do here. <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> it was a factory town and no college football or anything. And he proceeded to put a little money down and said, if you get it going, I'll put some money in. And I formed, I did my first fundraising. I formed an L. I learned how to put a limited partnership together, made it a nonprofit. I was really ahead of my time. I said, I don't see this thing making a lot of money. If we can break even and put some money into a charity coffer, I'd be happy. I had a good job. And that's what we did. And we became very successful. We actually were Pro Football Weekly Magazine, which is still around. Hub Arkush is uh, still very involved with it. Uh, his dad was the originator of the magazine in Chicago. Uh, they d used to do a weekly uh, page on minor league football around the country, and, and they had a rankings uh, survey, which was pretty, you know, they were kind of just going on what the information they could get. But Hub's dad had actually played minor league pro football in the Chicago area many years earlier, and he wanted to give it some consideration and coverage. And it was actually kind of a neat thing that they did that. Uh, and so they they actually had a rating service, so we ranked as high as the number one in the country several years later. We actually won the Northern States Football League Championship in 1976 in our third year of existence, I guess it was, yeah. And uh, and we I recruited a lot of players from regionally from Iowa, Iowa State, Drake, which was playing major college football back then, Northern Iowa, uh, and some other schools. We put, I think, five or six guys into the NFL out of that little town team. We had to build our own stadium almost uh, because the high school didn't want us to play in there. They were afraid we were going to tear up their turf. So we used a, a small semi-pro baseball park and had to add on to it. But it was a great experience for me. Maytag let me do it. I had a, access to a watch line because back then you had to pay to make long-distance calls. Uh, they gave me the code of that. They had a huge IBM computer that would print anything upside down, sideways. I could do playbooks and press releases. And they knew it would be good for Newton. And uh, since I was I was a manager, I was a retail advertising manager at the company at that point. And they allowed me to play, and they allowed me to do that. And I was able to put together a team, and we rounded up some local people. One of our best players, who was in a small college all American at Central College in Pella, when they were really good, was uh, was in the banking business. Was a great financials guy. He was my CFO, and I, we had people that came together and it was kind of a mini Green Bay Packers in fact uh, we were called sometimes the, the, the semi-pro or minor league Green Bay Packers and we were filling up our little stadium and we had it going and we called it a rock and sock and football on Saturday nights uh, and uh, we played teams from Chicago and Wisconsin and Omaha came into the league that had been the Mustangs and the city I live in right now, Davenport, I had a team in this area is known as the Quad Cities, had a farm team, a team that had been a farm team to the associated with the Chicago Bears, the Quad City Mohawks, and and we we were pretty good. We had a lot of good players, and we moved guys on to the NFL. I picked up some cuts from the NFL, and I started to learn the business and uh, that and and did a lot of promotional things we were proud we think we were told at the time we were the first minor league football team to ever have trading cards i did a deal with the local mcdonald's restaurants <laughs> they did trading cards and you got one when the kids went in to buy some buy hamburger or whatever they got a trading card every week and uh, you know so we had a lot we did some fun things and i cut my teeth and then I got a call one day uh from a fellow by the name of joe cap who was had been the national uh, coach of uh, there's football soccer in Austria as well as in uh, Yugoslavia and I think he was Yugoslavian uh, by bath background but was a very good soccer coach and, and coached in both countries he was the fellow that brought the first soccer style kickers to the National Football League and to America Pete Gogolak and Tony Fritsch and uh, sure. he got very, and he got, because he, he discovered, one, somebody showed up, as he told me, uh, at practice one day with an American football. <laughs> they were kicking it around, and he started to pay some attention to it and, and realized he'd seen a little American football and noticed they always kicked the ball at the end of their foot, you know, toe. Uh, and he thought, 
now you could probably kick it with the side of your foot. And that's how it all started. And he actually got these guys tryouts. And I think Fritch was the first one. I may have it backwards. A Gogolak. We can go, and I'm, I'm going to get them mixed up. But one of them end up with the with the Dallas Cowboys. It's been long enough now. But and they had some impact, obviously. And they changed they changed the foot in football, as I like to say about what they did. I mean, because the foot's still there, but the way the ball is kicked is very different than it was years ago, and for many many years. So he got intrigued with the NFL went to the NFL and said, you guys should bring some exhibition games over to Europe, to which the NFL, and this would have been in 1975 approximately, said, why would we want to do that? And and Commissioner Roselle, who I work for, who I have a huge amount of uh, respect for, and really, really was the guy that galvanized and brought the NFL from the – uh, limping along into the, uh, the shoot to get them up and launched to where they're at today and did a magnificent job of it. Very visionary thinker. Uh, and it was him or the, or just representing what the owner's sentiment was. Why would we want to take an American sport over to Europe? I mean, they just saw no, there was just no interest. And the guy cap said, well, is there any other pro football? I said, well, there's some minor league football out there. They told him, he said, there's a, and I'd had a couple of job interviews trying to get into the NFL. I loved my job at Maytag, but I knew already I wanted to get into the football business full time, not doing it as a you know running a, a minor league a nonprofit on the side. And my future wasn't as a player; it was going to be in the front office, and and that's where I knew I needed to head. And they had some information on me at the league office that had been sent to them from an interview I did with Harry Humes, the then general manager of the New Orleans Saints. And Harry liked some of the things I showed him. I would get interviews when I'd go on a business trip from Maytag. If I was in an NFL city, I'd call the team up and see if I could get an interview. And I got some. And Harry was one of them. And Harry sent my stuff to the NFL and told him, this guy's a pretty good young guy. He might be somebody you might want to think about someday. Well, the NFL had that information. And when they were in the meetings with Cap, <clears throat> they said, there's this guy out in Iowa which he had no idea where it was. Uh, this seems to be doing some pretty good things. I had been voted the Pro Football Minor League Executive of the Year by Pro Football Weekly Magazine. They had some awards they did every year. And we had been a very good team and and, and actually almost won that mythical uh, ratings title one year. I think we ended up second and we won our league. And, you know, we were doing some interesting things and we were making some noise. And, and so – I get a call from this guy, and he says, would you like to go to Europe and play football? So as it unwound uh, or came together, I was interested enough to go. He flew to Chicago from Europe, and I met him uh, in Chicago, and we talked. And I was just naive enough and anxious enough (laughs) to put a deal together with him to form a partnership. And I uh, raised, I put my second partnership together, and that was the American Pro Football Tour of Europe, I believe was the name of it. And uh, we raised pretty much local money. It wasn't a lot of money. It was like $30,000, as I remember. Uh, but it was enough to to, to pay for airfares. And uh, he, he had funds he brought along. But we had to pay for our airfare uh, and some promotional costs and uh, some equipment and this and that. But long story short, we took the, Iowa, we became the Iowa uh, Nighthawks for that trip. We were really in Newton, which is a suburb of Des Moines, a distant suburb. And, but we operated in the name Iowa Nighthawks. And we went along with the Chicago Lions, which is a, a city team in the Northern States Football League. Tough team. <clears throat> Had a lot of rough, tough guys on the team. And the ownership was Polish. Our Polish extraction, there's a lot of Polish people in Chicago. And uh, he was intrigued with the idea, so they became the team to go along. Originally, we were looking at taking four teams, but the matrix of it was too complicated at the time. And a couple of teams that thought they could put money together couldn't. But uh, Joe uh, Plotchek was his name, I believe. Uh, uh, The owner of the Chicago team had some money, and he wrote a check, and they went along. We beat the daylights out of them. They weren't as good as we were. We had good games with them in the league, but... For five, we played five games in five cities, and it was a little too much for them. And I picked up some extra, extra good players uh, as a recruiting tool. I said, "If you come play in Europe for five, if you play for us during the season, you can go to Europe with us." And uh, 
so I got some I got some pretty outstanding players that actually had been stars at Iowa and Iowa State and you and I in particular to come along. And a couple of guys have been cut from the NFL. So you're, so you're, you're okay. So the, you, in all of that, right? You, you essentially you've gotten almost like an MBA in football management, right? You, as well as uh, a specialty, I guess, in in the the art, I guess, of promotion, right? Which uh, clearly seems to serve you well because you you uh, obviously did get into the NFL at that point uh, using yeah, your those that, skills, actually, right? Which I didn't know at the time was going to happen. Uh, we we went over there. We played Paris, uh, Versailles Stadium. We played uh, a game in uh, Germany at, at, at uh, I believe it was Rhein-Main Air Force Base. It was a big Air Force Base uh, in the suburbs of Germany. We stayed in Landstuhl. Uh, and that game actually, I'll footnote it, became the starting point for American football really growing into what it is in Europe, which is substantial if you follow that at all over there. Sure. Uh, because uh, the base asked us if we would let the German workers bring their kids to the game. We did it on there. We did this game for the military. And we said, sure, why not? And there were all kinds of German kids running around. They were so intrigued with our game that after we left, they started hounding some of the, the, the uh, guys on the base, the soldiers, could we learn how to play football? And they, and they ended up rounding up footballs and taught them how to play. And then eventually put a, when the next year put a, a small league together in, in the Frankfurt area uh, with uniforms and it grew from there. Uh, and Germany right now uh, in, in Europe is, is the dominant league in American uh, football over there uh, in the American pro football league of Europe. And they have some of the best teams, not to say some of the other countries don't have good teams that are across the board. Germany's very, very, uh, very good. And, and, and the game fits the German mentality, it fits the German physique quite well. It's a good sport for Germany. But we then also went on and played in Vienna. We played in Graz, which is a, a large city in in, uh, in Austria. And we also played in Lille, France, which is up in the northern uh, border, uh, northern part of France or Belgium. And we had 22,000 paid there. It was a huge crowd, and that, that was a really exciting game. But the last game was in Vienna, and it was supposed to be in a stadium that was supposed to have been done two months earlier and that had been open for a month and a half. It hadn't opened yet. We were the first event. The, tro- the trolley car line got completed a week before the game, and for most people in, in Vienna, they went by you know tr- ground transit. They didn't drive. And nobody knew the trolley was running. They didn't know the stadium was done. Uh, it was a disaster, and we had a very small crowd. And the promoter that I worked with, Joe Cap, and another guy was involved with them, <laughs> realized they were going to lose money. We didn't know they were going to lose money. And I wasn't given a heads up completely. We had a really good crowd in Graz, and we get to Vienna, and they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> they took the money from the from the Graz game and took off, and and uh, uh, it was a mess. Uh, we got home all right. We had a charter flight played for, paid for, and uh, we got through it. We played the game, uh, and one, we had no idea where they were there, why they weren't there, and found out afterwards that uh, not Joe, but the uh, the other fellow that was his side of the financial picture got nervous and and actually took off with the proceeds from uh, some of the previous games and Joe Joe went after him <laughs> to try to catch him but that was the first uh first American pro football ever played in Europe and that led to the the we weren't totally responsible for it but that game in Germany I now know for fact uh, uh led to the to the start of uh of the Europe football and my son right now is playing over there Played for a Polish team last year. He played for the Iowa Hawkeyes. Uh, graduated a few years ago, backup linebacker, outside linebacker. Played by Chris Kirksey and and uh, Anthony Hitchens, who are both multi-year starters in the in the NFL. Done very well, all Big Ten linebackers at Iowa. And uh, and so I'm, I've become very conversant now with what's going on in Europe. And he's actually run into people that remember the Nighthawks coming to Germany and playing. And also know about me from bringing arena football to Europe. We played 28 games over there, I think, all together uh, over the years. You know, it's been some years because the commissioner that uh, ran the arena league for quite a while didn't really have any interest in it. He had kind of the same mentality the NFL owners did years ago by going to Europe. But uh, so that what happened was I got back. Uh, I didn't make any money on the deal. I survived. Uh, and I, in fact, I, there was some money. I owed some local part of my, I, I, it w- I got, well, I take it back. I, I got back from that and I went back to work for Maytag and they were fine with that. And everything worked out. We kept the night house going, but two years later, 
I was approached by a team in the Quad Cities where I'm at now, ironically, the Mohawks, who we used to just beat the daylights out of regularly, and they wanted to improve their team. They found out I really liked the Mississippi River and liked boating on it, and I'm looking out my office window at the river right now. Uh, and they, uh, their coach had been with the Bears and the Saints. He was from here, but he was a really good guy. He was a management with the John Deere Company, which is based here in, in the Quad Cities, the tractor and implement company, huge company. And he was able to work a deal out for me to come down here. I left Maytag, which my parents thought I was nuts, but I wanted to get into football, and I had an opportunity to basically get into it full time down here and reorganize this team, put it together the right way. They drew very small crowds. They were not very successful. They were at losing records. And a year later, we played for the league championship in the Northern States Football League, and we were we broke all kinds of attendance records, and, and, and we had I had – uh, half a dozen good players that have been in the NFL or late, late cuts that we're, we're able to get in at key positions. And we became a very, very successful team down here. And the fellow that had been running the team uh, but wasn't doing a very good job with it was very intrigued with the fact that we went to Europe. And he wanted to go. And he was willing to put some money up uh, to get it done. So he partnered with me. And I reached out and found a, a promotion company based in the States and Europe that I knew I was going to need because when I did it the first time, Joe Cap and the guy he had involved knew their way around over there, particularly Cap because of, of being all his connections to the soccer. Uh, but I knew getting the stadiums booked and, the, and a lot of the arrangements were going to require somebody beyond my expertise, uh, having just been there for one year. So we got it put together and we went over. And this time we focused on playing Belgium and Holland uh, primarily. And uh, we had some success with it, but it wasn't as successful as it should have been. And there were some things that the promotion company just didn't understand about American football and the positioning of it. Uh, we got into some conflicts with playing up against some major soccer tournaments, and, and, and we were vying for time with the soccer. And that was a mistake. And I learned from it. It, it, you know, you football over there is still a niche sport and will be forever. Uh, but it's growing quite a bit, but suffice to say, we lost some money and I, I got back at that point. I, I'd done this full time, was out of work and, uh, got, I, I fell back on some very basic skills, uh, some construction work I'd done when I was younger. I was helping build garages for a little while. I was unloading trucks and I was like, what's going to happen now? Uh, I bought a house, uh, I was married now, and uh, it was a little dicey. Uh, it was scary, in fact. And I uh, got a phone call one day from the NFL, and I thought it was a joke. And they called me to say uh, we would be interested in interviewing you here in New York. And they had this material on me. And what had happened was that I had a former coach from my Nighthawk team that moved back to his hometown of Shreveport, Louisiana. And he was a pretty good coach. I mean, we won a league championship with him. Uh, and he helped put that team together from a football standpoint. I didn't do it all by myself. Uh, and he had taken a job as a head coach of the Shreveport Steamer, which had been in the old World Football League. Sure. And s some of the old World Football League cities stayed together and they formed the American Football Association. Birmingham was in it. I'm trying to remember now. Jacksonville, there. Uh, I think Memphis was in it. There, uh, San Antonio was in. It. They had some of the teams from the old World Football League, and they kept the names. And they, because that went under after t uh, three years, and they tried to reignite it. And, and Shreveport actually was getting decent crowds. Some of the cities weren't too bad. And this coach, uh, Jim Williams, was his name. Uh, he was a great guy and a great friend. He, uh, older fella, he was a mentor. He was a good man. He helped me a lot. He said, I, I want you to come down here and, and be the GM. And, and there was a wealthy car dealer down there who owned several Ford dealerships and other Ford brand product, label product uh, brands, uh, that was funding it. And so they flew my wife and I down there and it was a chance to, to get back in the business and go to a higher level. And I knew I wasn't going to be going back to Europe. I knew there was potential there, but I certainly had, didn't have the wherewithal to do it right away. And so I was going to take this job. Now I had, I think I mentioned to you that I had interviewed with Harry Humes just as a courtesy before I went, you know, several years ago, earlier than that. So I called Harry Humes to say, guess what, Harry, I'm coming down to Louisiana to be in pro football. And he said, how are you going to do that? I said, well, I'm going to run the Shreveport Steamer. 
Well, that particular year, the Saints were terrible. <laughs> they weren't doing very well. Their attendance was bad. And Harry said, why are you going to do that? And I said, because I want to get into pro football full time. He said, well, wouldn't you rather be in the NFL? And I said, well, of course, but nobody's calling me. He said, let me make a phone call to New York to the NFL. I think they might have an opening for somebody like you. And sure enough, I get a call back from Harry that you're going to get a call from the NFL in the morning. And it happened. And it was Bob Carey, the president of NFL Properties, which is the marketing wing of the league. And we, they talked to me for four hours on the phone. And he said, I'm going to call you back in a couple hours. He called me back that afternoon and said, if we get a ticket wired to the Quad City Airport, could you fly to New York tomorrow? I said, sure. They said, we'd like to talk to you some more. The next morning, I got on a flight at 6 in the morning through Chicago and United to, to New York. I got to LaGuardia Airport, which I'd been in and out of with, uh, uh, well, we did a press conference, in fact, at the Waldorf Astoria uh, to announce the, the tour to Europe. And, in fact, as a sidebar to that, I walked up the street a few blocks to 410 Park Avenue and walked in the lobby of the NFL offices. It was on the 14th and 15th floor, but I walked in just to say that I had been to the Holy Grail. I had been to the door, in my mind, been to the, the gates to, to heaven, you know, for football heaven, and then because I had a few hours uh, before we had to do this press conference. So here I am. I've been in New York. I've been in and out of there. I get to LaGuardia. I come down, and there's a guy standing there, a chauffeur holding a sign up with the NFL shield that says Jim Foster. And on my way into the city, I'm thinking, God, I would would it be terrible if I asked him to have that sign? <laughs> if I could have it, because <laughs> I, I don't think I really thought I was going to get the job completely. <laughs> it happened so fast, but I didn't ask him. I got there, and an even better story. I walk into that same lobby where I'd walked in several years earlier, and I'm standing there waiting for the elevator to go to the 14th floor. And in walks the commissioner. And Pete Rosell's a tall guy. He was like 6'5". And, uh, I'm, and I'm 6'2". And I, and I walk in the elevator. He comes in behind me. The door's about to close. And I push 14. And he says to me, oh, you're going to the 14th floor. What are you doing up there? And I said, uh, I got an interview. And he goes, you must be that guy from Iowa, young guy from Iowa. <laughs> and I'm like, he knows who I am. <laughs> Wow, it's almost like you you were made before you even got into the office. Oh my God! There, the the theme song for the NFL I used to play on TV back then was da 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 and that was going through my head as I'm going up to the 14th floor, standing next to the Christian Arena Football League, going, "I can't believe this happened." Happening, I literally was going up to meet St. Peter, but he was on the elevator with me. <laughs> That's one of the halcyon moments of my entire life, and I. I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe this is happening. They had me there for eight hours. They grilled me. They ran everybody by me. They ran them by me again. They couldn't believe I was from Iowa. Uh, I took so much grief. Is it Idaho? Is it Ohio? Uh, everybody basically in management at the NFL uh, and NFL marketing properties uh, is the actual name. And it still exists. And it's very successful, hugely successful was an Ivy League graduate. And I'm from the University of Iowa with a degree in broadcast journalism and marketing advertising. <laughs> so so I, and they were all nice to me. I mean, it was a great experience. I couldn't believe it. It was like a whirlwind, like I got shot out of a cannon. And before I know it, eight hours later, I'm in a, in a limo back to LaGuardia to fly back to Iowa. And they said they'd get a hold of me. And I thought, okay. The next morning at about 8.30, my wife had just left for work. And we lived in this big old house that had 12-foot ceilings, this whole house built in the 1870s, really neat old house. Very close to where I live right now, in fact. Uh, the phone rang, and I answered it, and it was Bob Carey. And he said, Jim, how'd you like to come to work for the NFL as promotion manager? And I swear to God, I was on the ceiling floating up against the ceiling for at least five minutes. I mean, I, I just couldn't believe it. Uh, I, I still remember that call. I, if it was, it was housing enough to go up the elevator with Pete Roselle. But when I got that call the next day and they asked me that, I mean, it just changed my total life. I mean, it just was unreal. And I was very blessed and I've been blessed with a lot of things that happened in my life. Uh, but I did go to New York, uh, left Iowa and, uh, at we Thanksgiving day, uh, we left Davenport, went back to Iowa city where I'm from at Thanksgiving with my family. And we drove to New York the next day, and it was an incredible opportunity. It was an amazing job. I probably never would have left it, but 
opportunity strikes sometimes. And in 1981, I went to that indoor soccer game at Madison Square Garden, the major indoor soccer league all-star game, and pulled that now uh, iconic or <laughs> fable, whatever you want to call it, 9 by 12 manila envelope on my briefcase, which was full of press clippings on the Iowa Hawkeye basketball team when Lou Wilson was here. And they made the final four. Uh, again, they went to the final four that year. Uh, and the New York media didn't cover the Big Ten at all. That's one of the reasons Rutgers and Maryland are in the Big Ten now. Uh, but uh, I uh, I had something to write on. I, I did the outline of a hockey rink on it. And as they say, the rest is history in some respects. Okay, friends, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to quickly remind you that today's episode of Good Seats Still Available is brought to you by our friends at Audible, the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre you could think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices and MP3 players for listening anytime, anywhere. And for a limited time, my audience can listen to a free download of any book that they choose, as well as get a 30-day free trial when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. That's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And you can choose from over 180,000 titles, as we said, including uh, one that I'm listening to right now. It's called The Ten Gallon War by John Eisenberg. That's the story of the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future. Um, another one on my list, which I have yet to download, but is on my queue uh, that could be interesting to our audience here is called The National Forgotten League by Dan Daly. Entertaining stories and observations from pro football's first 50 years. Those are just two of the many thousands of titles to choose from, and not just in sports history, but you name the genre that uh, you might want to listen to and Audible's got it. By the way, two, uh, two guests perhaps that we'll have on the show hopefully sometime soon. But again... Go to audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free 30 day trial as well as your free audiobook download to try it out for yourself. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash good seats. And now back to our conversation. So, w- what were the uh, events that uh, got you to the uh, uh, the February 11th, 1981 MISL All-Star Game at Madison Square Garden, yep. which a game just for our listeners, everybody should know that I was at. <laughs> I was at. So I was in the building. You All were right, there? I was there with uh, what 13,000 other people. So Yeah, I talked to you. Were, I thought you probably the second person I talked to that was actually there. <laughs> there you go. Well, I, I grew up in the New York, New Jersey area. I was a New Jersey Rockets season ticket holder, one of the seven oh, okay. of those and uh, whatever. But um uh, that's not important right now. What is important is how, uh, why were you there? And uh, and then the, sort of the events like, and what happened while you were there? I'm just curious as to sort of the events that led up to why you happened to be in the garden watching an indoor soccer game, for God's sakes. Well, uh, I am the promotion manager in the NFL. I have an interest in sport and I love football, but uh, I was living out in Darien, Connecticut, and we had cable TV out there, as I remember. I think we did. Uh, and I saw a couple of New York Arrow arrows games from long island sure from nassau coliseum on tv and i thought it was kind of interesting playing soccer indoors who, who thought of that you know and uh and that was the extent of it at the, that point in time but then one day i pick up the times you know new york times at the train station riding in from darien into the city on the on the north the north uh, line the old uh, new haven line and uh from uh, bridgeport and i uh Get it? I, I I'm reading that there's going to be a major indoor soccer league all star game in Madison Square Garden a couple of days later, and uh, there was a guy I worked with there named Mark Fagan. who was a great guy, a young guy like me, and he was he was in charge of our most of what we call printed products, which was all the printed things that the NFL did, uh, you know, books and things of that nature, and. Uh, he, I said to him, hey, you want to go? And he likes sports. We talk sports a lot. I said, you want to go down and see these guys play soccer indoors? Because I wasn't going to get over to Nassau Coliseum. It was a hall over there. and you know, But I was going to be in the city that day. I'm working there. It wouldn't be that big a deal to go down, see it, and catch a train home. And he lived across the – he took the path train over from Jersey. Uh, and so – he said, yeah, let's do it. So after work, we went down and took a cab down and ate it. Uh, I think there was a, was there some restaurants called to- Toot Shores? Yeah, I think it was. Toot sure. Shores. It was one right across from the garden. We had a, went in there and had a burger and beer and 
walked across the street and it was probably, and I, I guess it was probably not even that they played, did they play quarters? They played, I think they just played two halves as I remember. Nope. It four, was four maybe quarters. halfway through the first half. No, four quarters. Yeah, definitely four quarters. Oh, it was four quarters. Cause so I was, I was trying to remember it's been so long. Yeah, it was, it was early in the, it was, it was part way through the second quarter then. And we were sitting up two thirds of the way up. Um, uh, and, uh, I literally turned to him and said, you know, Mark, if you could play soccer indoors, I'll bet you could play football indoors. And he said, how would you do it if you were going to do it? And I pulled that envelope out of my briefcase and drew the outline of a hockey rink on it and started going through this mental, visual, creative exercise of how you do it. And the way it unfolded was that I go back to my father. My dad played at Iowa when they played single platoon football after the war. It was still the way the game was played. And in fact, some of my best and fondest memories of football, rather than what I've been involved with myself, was I was fortunate enough to grow up in Iowa City at a time when a guy named Forrest Evashevsky came to Iowa and took a, a team that was pretty morbid and turned it into one of the best teams in the country. And they won the Rose Bowls going away. They were Big Ten champions. They won a mythical national championship, uh, a split pole uh, with a 59 team. I mean, to be a little kid in Iowa City, and, and when, when that was going on, it was just incredible. I mean, and my dad was uh, had, was involved with the program back when you could be uh, as a business person. And uh, and he also played in, in three uh, alumni games. So I got to see my dad play against some of the best, best college players in the country that were going to the NFL. And that was a thrill. That's when I knew I wanted to be a football player because my dad, I got to see my dad play in the, in the, spring, in the spring games. Was a, and it was an alumni format back when they used to do that. <laughs> But they, the alums actually beat Iowa in the last game <laughs> because they had so many guys coming back from the NFL. <laughs> and so they, they ended that the series. They said, decided that wasn't a good thing. But at any rate, I, uh, I, 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 I had that experience of them still playing single platoon and right up until the late fifties. And when I was a, when I was a little kid, when I played youth football, if you were an end, you were an end. If you're, if you're a guard, you were a guard. If you were a back, you were a back, you know, you know, you know and a quarterback played both ways. And I was always a, I was always a pass catcher or a, a, a de- defensive guy, you know, playing back there, trying to tackle people, but uh, playing both ways. So it just made sense as I'm looking at this field and thinking, how would you do it when he's said that I immediately said well you know you'd probably got to go back to single platoon football because you're not going to have 60 70,000 seats you maybe got 16 17,000 and you know you got to cut your costs so right away I'm going into my football I ran football teams mentality and I start noodling down single platoon and then he said well you how many guys you think you put out there and I said I don't I don't think you're going to get 11 out there I, I said, I'm thinking maybe seven, eight, maybe nine. You're going to have to reduce the size of the, of the teams on the field. You're gonna, there's not enough room. And I guessed that night, I said, I'll bet the field's going to be about half as long as an outdoor field. And I was darn near accurate. I mean, it's a 50-yard field instead of 100 yards, and the end zones are 8 yards instead of 10 yards. And that fits in a standard NHL hockey rink, and it's 85 feet wide. You literally can take four football fields indoor football fields, arena football fields, and put them inside an outdoor uh, field. And actually, I had some conversation with a Meadowlands that didn't get very far. We, did, we just couldn't pull logistics together. It was, it was one of the sites we considered to take our preseason in 1988, and we had eight teams, I think that's right, maybe it was 90, and to play four games at the same time, divide up the stadium into four quadrants, have four fields set up, and literally have uh, Team A play Team B the first quarter, and then it just keep rotating around. So all the all eight teams ended up on four fields playing four quarters, but against the different four different teams. Well, that would have been interest- That would have been really interesting. That would have been like a round robin tournament, like all at that's once. That's what it was. Yeah, and, wow, that's and, interesting. And I wanted to do it, but it, you know, we were young. We were just trying to get the thing going and it was just too much too early and we never got a chance to revisit it but uh yeah so you literally and and i and i I realized pretty quickly on even that night i said you know what i'll bet the best seats in in the nfl or a major college stadium like iowa i'm familiar with in the big 10 are going to be farther away than the worst seat in a lot of these arenas and i was pretty much right about that because you put the footprint of a, a, a football field a, a standard outdoor football field, a major stadium, on top of an arena, 
you'd be surprised how few seats are not covered up, <laughs> you know? So, uh, I had an interesting idea and then, you know, and I started, we were toying with it and I said, well, you know, probably eight or nine guys. And then the lightning struck. He, he said, uh, are you, I said, you know, I don't think you can punt because you're going to hit these gondola scoreboards, which were becoming popular at the time. And I said, the arc of a punt is very, it's a very high arc. I said, if you kick the ball, it doesn't arc as high. And you can drive a football when you kick it easier than you can with a punt. Uh, although that's one of the reasons sometimes you see these rugby-style punters right now, because they don't arc the ball as much, because they drive it off the side of their foot. But at any rate, I so I, I put down on fourth down, you don't punt, you try a field goal. Because I, I thought the worst thing in the world would be to be going for it on fourth down. You do that in flag football outdoors. You know, you know, I said, I, you know, if this, and, and I had no idea this was ever going to become a functioning sport, but I'm thinking in terms of if you're really going to do it. So I wrote that down, and then the lightning in the bottle hit. And that was, I realized that on a smaller field, if you're kicking, a lot of balls are going to be going up in the end, end zone seat. And the big, the, the NFL had just, at, while I think what was there, or just before I got the NFL, I went there in 70, late 79, started hoisting up the slack nets in the end zones to catch the balls that were going through. Because up to that point in time, as the stories were related to me, you know, I used to send some ball boy up there with a coupon for the local pizza joint to get the ball back. And it got to the point that the guy said, no, I don't want the pizza. I want the ball. Get out of here. You know? <laughs> so they were trying to figure out how to get the balls back, and which would, leads to an interesting story when I actually formed the league, which I'll come back to if you want to hear it. But uh, So I said, no, you know what? Why don't we – put a net up behind the goal, goal post. And then I thought, wait a minute, I can't have a full size goal post. And I sketched on that envelope, which is they now have in the hall of fame in Canton, Ohio. I sketched uh, a, a, the skinny goal post with a high crossbar. And that actually came from Forrest Abyshevsky because when I was a kid, my dad would take me over to practice sometimes because uh, he was pretty involved with the program. He'd been a GA coach when he got done at Iowa for a while, too, after he got hurt. So I'd go over to practice with him. I was just a little snot-nosed kid, and I'd be running around. And this goalpost looked like it was crazy because I'd been on a, the high school football field. It was near our house, and it looked so much different. It was like it went up forever and it had this little bitty crossbar. And I, I sketch in this crossbar, this, this goalpost. And I said, this is Abby's goalpost. Which Mark Fagan said, who's Abby? So I had to tell him the story. So I, I uh, sketched that in. And then I thought about the fact, Hey, could you put nets up to rebound the ball? And that's what I did. I sketch him in. I said, Mark, we'll put a big net, a big world's largest pitchback net on either side of the goalpost. We'll have it hanging off the ground because you have rafters. And I, so I sketched it that way. The, although the original sketch, I, I don't have the envelope in front of me uh, or a copy of it. I, but I, I think originally I had it on the ground and then I, and I lifted it back up because I thought, Hey, you can hang it from the rafters and you'll have, be able to run under the net because it's gonna, Although initially we did have the nets all the way down to the field and then realized uh, that, you know, guys are going to get caught in the nets and everything. <laughs> it's not gonna, fingers are going to get yanked, and that doesn't work. So we lifted them up off the ground, and they are eight feet off the ground. They've been that way since the very first test game in Rockford. But So that was the idea, and you could actually play the ball off the net and the carom, you know, and he thought that was a really cool idea. So, you know, that was that's the genesis of what happened. There was some other thinking, you know, about, you know, certain plays and this and that, but it was this, this basic idea that you could play it indoors. So I, I, we went our merry way that night. He went back to New Jersey after, I don't even remember much about the soccer game <laughs> after that, but, <laughs> uh, you know, and I'm not a big soccer guy, obviously. I, and see, the funny thing was we had no soccer in Iowa. When I was growing up, there was nothing. I mean, nobody played it. And then we had a, an exchange student come from, uh, Uruguay, uh, Jose Otero, and Jose missed soccer so much that he got some of the football players, some of us, to go out and kick the ball around with him. All we did was just knock each other down. Uh, but that was as close as we ever got. So I really had never experienced soccer at all until I went to that game. And, and it, it's kind of funny how it turned out. But we went on our merry way. The next morning I come into the office. Mark had got in before I did a little bit. His train, he took us a little earlier. And guys are going, hey, 
what are you going to do about your indoor football? And I'm going, what do you mean? Uh, and I, I'm like in a panic. I'm thinking like, I love my job at the NFL. <laughs> I'm not going to do anything, you know, <laughs> little than I know. Uh, and he had told some guys in the office about, and they wanted to see the, the drawing. So the envelope is still in my briefcase. I got home at midnight, went to bed, got up, came back in the morning. I hadn't even told my wife about it. I thought she could care less probably. Some goofy idea because I'm always, I'm always having ideas. I always have since I was a little kid. But uh, suffice to say that uh, so guys are kicking it around like, well, that's cool. This isn't, you know, somebody said, oh, you got to have a penalty box like hockey. I thought that was stupid at the time. Still, I think I didn't do that. But it, but then what happened was a fellow that was a senior creative director for, uh, uh, oh, I want to say gray advertising. That's not right. It was our, it was our advertising agency we used uh, by the name of John Gagan came in uh, to see me on some stuff he was doing for me, some creative work uh, for marketing of the league and promotion. And Fagan knew him, Mark, Mark and Mark comes in and said, Hey, did Jim tell you about his idea for ind- indoor football? Well, he told him about it. He thought it was a really cool idea. He was looking at the envelope. He loved football. He was, a, he was from Cincinnati. He was a Bengals fan. And uh, he had ideas right when he was very creative. So he could envision it really, really well. He came back about five days later and he opens up this big art release and pulls out, and I have it, uh, it was like three by three by two by three drawing that he'd done with colored markers, I believe, but with a lot of detail, what it would look like to be in an arena football game in, in an arena. And it was like, it was a halcyon moment because what was in my head, he had transferred the paper to a to an artboard, and I'm like, oh my god! It, 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 he had the nets there hanging, and he, had, I mean, the audio. I mean, he took a lot of time to do it. And I was just overwhelmed by it. And he said, Jim, this is a good idea. This could work. And he stayed involved with 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 me all the way up into the first season. He defected our advertising all the way through the first season. And he did a lot of it pro bono just because he was so enthused about it. And, and uh, so that was the first vision of it. And then guys kept asking me about it. You ought to do something about it. Uh, and uh, then I had another friend that I rode the train with back and forth to Darien. That guy be a good personal friend by the name of Brad Barden, who was also in the, was in the ad agency business with Dentsu Advertising, which was the big Japanese agency that, that had a lot of accounts in the United States, particularly with the Japanese car companies. And and Brad had been with some other ad agencies, and and Brad said, you know, I know guys that work with uh, sports television that ride the train out to Darien. A lot of them lived out in that area, and he said we ought to you, we ought to talk to them about what you're doing. And I said, well, Mark, I, you know, this is just a rough idea. And he said, No, no, we had to bounce it off him. So we're on the train one day, and we go to the bar car to have a beer, and he said, See that guy over there? That's Bill Grimes. He's the president of ESPN television. He said, I know Bill really well. He lives down the street from me. So he brings me over and says, Bill, this is Jim Foster. He's the promotion manager of NFL properties. He said, but he's got this idea for playing football indoors. And Bill goes, really? He says, wow, that's kind of interesting. How would you do it? And so I'm telling him a little bit about it. And he said, you know, we ought to sit down and talk about that someday. And so we get off the train and Brad says to me, you got to do something about this, Jim. <laughs> I go, yeah, I guess I should. <laughs> uh, so I made, we were able to make uh, small print copies of the, uh, uh, which was a task back then because you didn't, you couldn't transfer drawings that were big to small very easy. You know, we were able to do it. We made some drawings and then I wrote a business plan up. I actually took a couple of days off because by then it was spring. And I remember sitting and I, I it, it was, a, it originally was my kitchen table when I came out of college. It was a, one of those old, uh, a metal and a kind of a ceramic, uh, it looked like ceramic. It had metal trim on them. It was kind of a deco art looking thing. And I kept it all these years because I sat at that table on our porch, a screen and porch in Darien, and wrote up the rules of arena football, wrote up a basic business plan, an overview of how it would work. And I couldn't type to save my life because when I grew up, you know, typing was optional and I had a secretary right out of college. So I was actually getting girls that worked for me, worked at the NFL for me, uh, or with us, uh, you know, for various departments. I'd bribe them with a free dinner at a restaurant they wanted to go to or lunch or something <laughs> to type up these pages of manuscript all written by hand. Uh, and so I got it all done. And Brad then, Brad Barton uh, from Dentsu, set up 
meetings with NBC, CBS, ABC, uh, Turner Network, and ESPN. And we went around and we dropped, we, I had a, I, I got an art case to put the big drawing in and we'd take that and we had these business plans, uh, you know, printed off and then collated and I'd go in and we'd, we'd tell them what it was and they all were interested in it. And NBC called me up and I had met with uh, Art Watson, who was the, then the president of NBC Sports, and Sean McManus was there with him. And Sean, I think right now is the president of CBS Sports if he hasn't retired yet. And uh, they called me back and said, we'd like to talk to you more about this. And he is, and Bill Grimes, we went went with Bill and, and, and Scott Gutowski. Scotty Gutowski was his number two at the time, as I remember. And uh, they really liked it a lot. And they said, we want to get back to you. So I went to NBC the second time. They offered me a contract to play a game on their Saturday afternoon sports anthology show. And I had like a four-year, what, I'm trying to remember. No, it's, yeah, I, we ended up with a four-year window to do it. They weren't in a big hurry, but they, they wanted to do a game to see how it would play, which was in keeping with my thought process from the beginning. I wasn't thinking. Once this thing started to get some legs underneath, I'm thinking, God, if we were really going to do this, how would you do it? We're well, not going to go out and put a lead together right away. Well, you got to test this thing. you got to really understand what you're dealing with. Because if it doesn't work, I wasn't even sure that mechanically it was going to work on that small field. That was the first thing I had to get clear in my head and make sure that from a, from a, from a mechanics logistics standpoint, it worked. So we negotiated a four year window. It was very easy to do. They were very willing to work with me. They gave me $50,000 in rights fees to do it and $50,000 to produce it. And I thought, Oh, I can't believe this. This is unreal. What am I going to do? I get this great job at the NFL. And I pretty much told them, I don't really want to walk away from my job as a promotion manager in the NFL. I had mean, like this dream job. I was a guy from Iowa that, and, you know, fairy dust had been sprinkled on me and I was, I was just living the life, you know, and, uh, and it was going well there and I didn't really want to leave. And, uh, so they said, yeah, that's cool. Well, you know, we just want to have the rights to work with you if you do something. So I still had that signed contract. And then, uh, I went back to Bill Grimes with, with Brad and Bill said, you know, that's cool. Cause if you can get NBC to do it, that's actually a good thing. And he said, uh, if this really takes off, then we would ask to have the, we can negotiate out a window for cable television. And I said, that's great. So he said, we're there. I got a letter from Stone a file. He said, we want to do it. So let's just see where it goes. Well, at that point I was busy doing, putting a major promotion together uh, for the NFL called the NFL tailgate program, which was the first time the NFL really ever looked at tailgating and decided to try to market it. And I was the guy that did that and uh, it was very successful. And that was the heart and soul of what I was doing at that point. But as time went along, I began to, I, I kept thinking about it and working with it. And Brad kept bugging me and John Gagan, the guy that, uh, that did the original drawings kept saying, you got to do this. And I was happy doing what I was doing with the NFL, but it was kind of in the back of my head that I, I couldn't let it go fallow. Uh, I, I started using disclosure letters because somebody said to me pretty quickly on, you know, somebody might steal your idea. And I hadn't really thought about that, you know, and so I started using disclosure letters. And one of the amazing things that happened was I went to work with the Pro Football Hall of Fame game in Canton in 1980. Was it the 80? It was the second game in 81 that I did. And I'm in this, uh, at this, uh, get together for all these famous, uh, former Hall of Famers, which was really as cool. I had more fun doing the Hall of Fame games than I ever did doing the Super Bowl or the Pro Bowl in Hawaii. I mean, they were all great events and to be a part of them was special, but to go to the Hall of Fame game and, and to end up talking to, you know, you know, Gail Sayers or Nick, Dick Night Train Lane, who I met or some of those guys. I mean, it was just phenomenal. Uh, and, and, and actually learned some things from some of those guys. I, I asked questions about when they played single batoon and how, how it worked and, you know, how they felt about it. And a lot of them to the man were like, God, that was the way the game should be played. You know, we don't like all the specialization. When you were out there, you were, this was mine on mine, mano mano, you know, I mean, we, you know, you played both ways. You knew the game. You you played offense and defense like you do in basketball. You know, I mean, it was interesting. And so I'm at the bar getting a beer, and I get introduced to this guy. His name is Howard Balzer, and he's the, he was a sporting uh, football editor for the Sporting News in St. Louis. And we strike up a conversation, and we end up going over and sitting down at a table, and Howard's talking to me, and we're just talking football and, you know, NFL and, and it was having a great time. We, we got to be very, very close friends. 
But what happened was he says to me at some point, you know, he said, someday somebody's going to invent a new game uh, that's going to just change everything in sports. And I'm looking at him like, does he know what I have? <laughs> I don't even know the guy. So I said to him, you know, that could happen. I said, you know, would you excuse me while I go to the restroom? I run out to my rental car. In my briefcase, I've got a packet on arena football, which was just called indoor football at that point. I had to put a name on it and the disclosure letter. So I bring it in. I sit down. I said, would you like to know about this new sport that might happen? He says, what do you mean? You just mentioned it. I said, yeah. I said, well, I have something here. If you'll sign this disclosure letter, which he was very dubious about signing at first. After I signed it, we go through this whole thing and Howard Balzer became a convert right there. He said, oh my God, this is amazing. He said, this is really cool. So Howard tracked what I was doing from that point on behind the scenes. He was sworn to secrecy. He was the best guy in the world about it. Well, we played the test game in Rockford when I went public finally. And, and, and all those people came, those 1500 people came to see a, a real game for, you know, a test game for the first time. And it was exposed. Howard got the invite to be the media rep there. He was the first guy from the media, from print media ever to go. And he had exclusive rights to that. And then I invited ESPN and they sent, uh, they sent a crew out from Chicago, which ran on ESPN Sports Center. And I don't know, that's still on YouTube. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Uh, Brett, Greg, uh, Greg Gumbo's got this big <laughs> head of hair. And they do this thing about this new game in, in Rockford, Illinois. Uh, we ran that night on Sports Center. It was, oh my God, it was like, you were on Johnny Carson or something, you know, I mean, it was unbelievable. And Howard broke a full page story in the sporting news the following Tuesday. I think it came out about this new game called indoor, uh, this new indoor football game. Well, let, and, let, uh, let's talk about that because that we're, uh, we, we're, we're going to blow through your USFL detour because I, we, I don't want to get, get away from the story here because yeah. on Sunday, April 27th, 1986 in the afternoon, apparently, apparently it was some yep. debate as to whether it was in the, in the evening or whatever. No, it was, it was an afternoon game, game, one o'clock kickoff. There you go. We're, we're at the uh, Rockford Metro Center, which is now called the, the Metro the, Center, right? Which is about now, a now called 5,000 C, 6,000 C right? arena. Now, now called the BMO Harris uh, Bank Center, which uh, yeah. was uh, general managed by a guy named Doug Logan, later to become the MLS commissioner. That's right. Um, give me some sense of, okay, so uh, if you can sort of fast forward, how did you get from socializing and, and, and non-disclosuring this idea to the actual test game? How did you know that it was time and how much preparation and why Rockford and, and you know, give us a little bit of insight as to sort of what's going through your head in this process because you're literally now it's almost like a wedding right you're, you're planning and you're trying to put it all together you think no, it's yeah. going to work but the, you don't know until it, uh, until it happens right birthing a baby really <laughs> Another a little analogy. bit of both sure. well actually we do have to go back to the usfl because the usfl was what cemented uh the reality that i needed to do it uh so i'm happy at the nfl i love my job but in the third year the usfl usfl gets announced and in fact uh I would find out later that they had been talking to ESPN when ESPN was talking to me and they'd been talking to NBC. Uh, and, but the, at that point they were pretty preliminary too. So NBC went ahead and signed me up and Bill Grimes liked the idea so much as I would find out later that he said, Hey, no matter what happens with the USFL, this arena football thing might be interesting. Well, the timing worked out pretty well for me because when they announced the USFL, I was, totally committed to the, to doing my job at the NFL. I didn't have the funding. I didn't, I, I was, I didn't see the, you know, and you made a good point there. I asked a good question. I didn't really see the path at that point, getting me to doing arena football yet. Uh, and I was, I mean, I'm working for the, the best sports league in the world, in my opinion. And, you know, and, and I, I've got a tremendous job. I'm flying all over. I'm working with the different teams. I'm doing the Pro Bowl, the Hall of Fame game, the Super Bowls. I mean, it, it was an incredible experience for somebody my age. I was 28 years old when I got hired by the NFL's promotion manager. I mean, I, I found out that they had interviewed guys who were a lot older, a lot more experienced guys with MBAs, most of them, yeah, probably all of them. I mean, I was just like shot in the dark that, that hit, you know. And I did a good job for him. I won two uh, gold helmet awards uh, for marketing excellence from the NFL. I, you know, I'm very proud of that. And uh, those, are the, those are the Emmys of, their, of the business of the league. So, I mean, uh, I don't even know they do them anymore, but they did then. But suffice to say that I was pretty happy. And then the USFL gets announced. And I got a call one day from the USFL. Uh, they had some information on me and said, uh, would you be interested in talking to us about 
uh, coming over to do marketing for the USFL, to which I basically said politely, I'm very, very happy with the NFL. If I'm going to do marketing and do promotion in the capacity I'm in, I'm not really interested in a lateral move. <laughs> and the guy that called me says, well, would you be interested in the USFL under any circumstances? I said, the only thing I'm really interested in long term at this point, not mentioning that I had this idea in the back of my head, uh, was, and this was my goal at that point, was to be a general manager of a team. I, cause I enjoyed running the football teams I'd run, the, uh, the Nighthawks in Iowa and the, and then the, the Quad City, uh, the Blackhawks down here in the Quad Cities, which straddles Illinois and Iowa where we're at. And, uh, I said, uh, so I'm not, you know, that's kind of my goal. And he said, well, we could talk to you about that. He said, really? He said, yes, we need to hire some good, bright young general managers, uh, and you might be a prospect for that. So I actually ended up interviewing with a Birmingham Stallions, love the owner down there, great guy. Market was not that attractive. Uh, Chicago uh, Blitz, although I never went for an interview because I didn't get to that point. Uh, Detroit talked to me. I wasn't real enthused about that because uh, we'd done the Super we done the Super Bowl in Detroit, which was a train wreck. <laughs> we got through. Oh God, was that was that well? And and then Arizona got in the mix. And I said to my wife Susan, who's from the Chicago outside Chicago, we're from the Chicago area. I said, Susan, would uh, what do you think? And she said, Well, I think you should go do the interview in in uh, Arizona uh, first. Uh, the warm weather sounds great. She knew some. She'd been out there. I I'd been there for business a couple of times. She said, "Go out there." So I went out and interviewed out there. It went extremely well. I was comfortable with the situation. They were a little behind the curve. They were not as organized. But I thought, hey, I can deal with that. I accepted the job there, and we moved to Phoenix. Uh, and I was uh, executive vice president, or was I assistant general manager? I think maybe I might tell was assistant general manager. I was in charge of everything but football operations, and I did do a little bit with player personnel. But that's really, and I knew already that wasn't my cup of tea. That wasn't my strength. I had some some abilities there. My strength was putting the deal together, marketing it, building it. Uh, and, and so I took that job. Guess who the general manager was for football operations? Harry Humes <laughs> from New Orleans. Small world. But, yes. And he'd been working with George Young uh, with the Giants, and it was kind of a last job for him. And, 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 and yeah, it was a small world. It turned out to be a really interesting experience. The owner had no background with sports at all. He was a, a refugee a uh, Jewish uh, refugee that fled with his family from Austria, as I remember, right as World War II was breaking out. Uh, he was a bookworm. He was smarter than the Dickens, graduated from Stanford with honors, and went into the real estate development business and made a fortune developing a couple of the uh, first self-contained suburbs in the Bay Area in San Francisco. And his CFO had played small college football, loved football, and when the guys that raised the money did the funding for the USFL, they went out and got the, the pertinent information and some of the key markets they're looking at is the guys that really had the money to do it. And, and, uh, he was one of them. And so they went to him and, and his CFO talked him into doing the team. He never would have done it on his own. And he only stayed in for a year, which is probably smart because he sold it for a profit. Uh, and his name is Jim Joseph. He was a really nice guy though. And he had some marketing sense and we got along pretty well which really frustrated the CFO because the CFO had visions of himself kind of coming in and quasi running this team. I didn't know that at the time when I took the job. Uh, we got to kind of didn't get along all that well because he was not a marketing guy. It was supposed to be all about the football on the field. You didn't mar- need to market anything. It was the football is going to sell itself. And he became a fly in the ointment because he stalled the process of hiring a, a head coach because he was trying to get his fingers into this whole thing. And long story short, we ended up getting a guy that was a good coach, but not a head coach. His name was Doug Shively. He'd done the linebackers coach for the Falcons and actually ended up going back there after his, his uh, one year uh, as the head coach of the Arizona Wranglers. But we did put together a very interesting marketing organization. We were one of the worst teams in the league. Uh, which I can thankfully at this point say I had nothing to do with because I didn't, uh, and particularly because of, of this Tyler guy. But we did, I had a pretty clean slate to put together a pretty aggressive marketing program. And we did some things that had never been done before. I was really concerned about getting a good crowd for the first game. I knew our football team was going to be a little suspect. By the time we got our coaching staff, I knew there were problems with player personnel, uh, and we were behind the curve. The first game we played, 
I brought the Beach Boys in, which is a band I'd actually had a little familiarity with and had done a little bit with. They played the, the Iowa's got one of the big state fairs in the country, and they played there a couple times. And my football team, the Nighthawks, they would hire us to come in and be bodyguards and, and security for the these big concerts. And I'd actually ended up getting to know the Beach Boys because I was a wide receiver. I wasn't a big lineman. They put me behind the stage of their trailer where they dressed, and I got to know them. And so I booked them. And it came about because there was a guy out at the time trying to put post-game concerts together with the Beach Boys and some other acts of that nature at baseball games. And I thought to myself, why would you, but you had to sit around for half an hour and wait for him to get the stage all set up and everything. I thought, why would you do that? Why not do it pre-game and have everything pre-organized? So I, and I called the guy about it. He thought I was nuts. So I said, okay, I'll do it on my own. I didn't tell him that. I ended up putting together a pre-game concert with the Beach Boys. We promoted the daylights out of it. We had, I think, 42,000 paid for that game. We had a pretty good crowd. And, and the Beach Boys were a big part of it. I, and that concept actually would carry over to, with me to some of the stuff I did in arena football. And it went great. We got our butt beat by the Oakland Invaders. Uh, we weren't a very good team. Uh, and then the next game, I brought in a guy that I'd grown up listening to his music. Uh, and I'd met him once because he'd played in Phoenix. And I got a chance to meet him backstage. And that was Harry James, a great trumpet player and big band leader from the World War II era. And we had all these retired people living in Phoenix, and this was in March. And so I figured, hey, why not get after that segment of the audience? And we drew a pretty good – we didn't draw as many as we did for the first game, but we drew a lot of older profile you know, demo people for that game with Harry James. It, was, it turned out to be one of the last concerts he ever played. He got sick not long after that and died. And that was – both of them were great experiences. But it showed me that you could leverage – uh, entertainment with football. Nobody I found out had ever done a, a major level pro football game with a concert before. I was first time I ever do it. I didn't know it until after I did it. So, uh, but I had a good year there in the sense that we did a lot of interesting things with marketing. I learned a lot, but I also began to realize as that year went along that trying to compete with the NFL was stupid. Uh, when I when I took the job, I I thought this is going to have to be a niche sport in the spring summer. And the guy that designed the league, David Dixon, who was out of New Orleans, was a successful antique dealer there, uh, had the idea originally. But David uh, and I actually got into a little pissing match with him on a, on a talk show some years later with a, with a talk show, sports talk show host out of New Orleans who was interviewing me about arena football. And they asked me about the, the USFL. And I said, the USFL could have worked if they would have stuck to the, the original concept of bring a, being an off-season league, which is what I always envisioned arena football from the very beginning being. I never saw it as a fall league. This was a game in the off-season for, for football fans that really weren't big baseball fans. And in fact, when the USFL was announced, I had to, I had to go to, Anna, a go to ES, or at first NBC, and then I went to Bill Grimes as a courtesy because my contract was with NBC. And I said to him, look, these guys got here first. They're well-funded, which they were. Uh, they're organized. I don't see a window for me right now with arena football, to which they agreed. And they said, let's just play that by ear and see how it plays out over the next four years. They were not involved with the USFL. They passed on it. ABC took it and ESPN took it as a package. And, uh, and Grimes said, no problem. He said, we're going to see how – Grimes was not particularly – enamored with the USFL. He thought the idea was good of off-season football, but he, I think he was already seeing some things as the head of ESPN, as president of ESPN, that bothered him from a broadcast standpoint. Some There were some things that were bothering him. He didn't, or at, Liber, at, at that time, didn't say much about it. He told me some things afterwards. It just, it, along the same lines of what I was talking about, there, were, there was there was always from the beginning with the USFL this tension with some of the owners about, we want to be the NFL. Some of these guys bought these teams somehow thinking they were going to end up in the NFL. Uh, well, which is, uh, including our current U.S. president. Yes. Right? Well, uh, I had some experience with our current president. Uh, if you voted for him, my apologies. But uh, uh, what happened was that, you know, we got through the first year, but they were losing a lot of money. And the bigger thing that I saw was we were drawing a fair amount of fans if the teams were marketed properly. Orlando, uh, the guy down there uh, who died from uh, brain cancer, God, he was good. And he had uh, Jim McKay working for him, who still uh, who's, who runs the uh, bowl game in, in Tampa to this day. In fact, when Iowa played down there, when my son was a senior, I had a chance to see him briefly. Uh, uh, oh, Bassett, Harold uh, uh 
Yeah, Bass you're talking about the, the, yeah. Tampa, the Tampa Bay Bandits, uh, Bassett yeah. and uh, Burt Reynolds. Yeah, brilliantly Burt, operated Burt Reynolds They were the Bassett, yeah. but they had more resources than I had. They got started earlier, and they had a pretty good football team, too. There were some teams that were pretty well run. Then you had San Antonio Gunslingers, which is a train wreck, and, and they, and they, uh, they uh, the goal, what was the LA team, the Express? Oh, what a train wreck. That was the worst. Oh, God. Playing in the Coliseum. We played there. I mean, it, you know, some were okay, some weren't so good, but if you marketed it properly and you had a semi- entertaining competitive team it could have worked but at the end of the year and you, you brought him up so i'm going to i'll talk about it briefly we go to toronto for a league meeting and and you know and overall there was a fairly good feeling about the usfl guys are losing a lot of money the biggest issue was that a lot of the owners were having a hard time dealing with picking up their local paper the chicago tribune or the or whatever town denver you know post and and, and reading that they were a second class football league because they bought these teams because in many cases they weren't going to buy an NFL team. They weren't going to get by the old boy club standards. And so they did this instead, but they really wanted to be in the NFL and they were bothered by the, 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 the fact that they were being told that they were second class citizens. It wasn't the NFL, but it was pretty entertaining football. It was analogous in some respects to the, the original American football league, but they were having a hard time with it. So we go to Toronto. There was, supposed to, there was some serious consideration for an expansion team up there. That's why we did it there. And this guy named Donald Trump shows up. Now, I knew Trump from New York because I had been there, and he built the tower. And, you know, he was a brash, braggadocio young man uh, trying to get his name in the paper. I mean, he was doing the same thing back then he is now. He walked around that meet the set of meetings. I remember him being in the bar, which was the first time I saw him. A lot of the owners were in there. We're all in there. It was between, it was after the first day session. And I don't think he even got there until then. Uh, and he is holding court. He's doing a campaign rally, just as he did when he ran for president. This is going to be the greatest thing that ever happened. We're going to move to the fall. We're going to take the NFL. We're going to punish them. We're going to show them that we're so much better than they are. They have no idea what we're going to do to them. <laughs> when I watched the, the, the 30 for 30 series uh, uh, on the USFL that ESPN did, yeah. uh, Small Potatoes, I just sat there and cracked up uh, because – the, it, it just reminded me when I listened to him do the debates and when he campaigned, it, the, the sound bites are identical. The message was the same. And I am the greatest was in there too. I'm going to lead you to the promised land, you know? And the problem was that some of these owners bought into it because their egos were bruised more than anything else. They didn't like being told they were second class owners. They, and he was, his message was, we're going to move to the fall and we're going to punish him. We're going to force him to their knees and we're going to force a merger. His blueprint was the original AFL merger, but it was, but he had, but, but like so many other things with Trump, he never did his homework on why that was so different than what he was trying to do. When the AF, when the original AFL got started with Hunt and, and, uh, that crew, who I got to know, incidentally, uh, Lamar almost bought an arena football team before he passed away. And that was a really good experience to get to spend some time with him hmm. and share some stories. But uh, they came in when the, the NFL was really starting to have some success on television. But the problem was the NFL left the back door open because, you know, uh, I, I believe it was yes, they were wed the CBS on it with exclusivity. Uh, and CB and NBC had nothing, as I remember. It wasn't it NBC that did the original AFL? I think that's right. Yes. I'm going yes back it was. Yep. And and so the NBC that wasn't the same deal all those years later. NBC was ticked off that they couldn't get a contract with it with the NFL at the NFL at that time. And ABC was still pretty young, so they weren't really in the hunt yet. And so here's the AFL and NBC picks it up and they televise it and they're playing amazing offensively oriented throw the football type of game and it worked. And then they had the money to go after the NFL and really get into a pissing match, as you know, from history to, to take some pretty good players away. And Trump just did not understand that the leverage was different at that point. The, if, if, if the NBC had not been there for the original AFL, they never would have made it. But the the opportunity is there. I mean, the US, USFL was on ABC. They were on ESPN. They had cable. And both of those didn't make that much difference because the NFL was so much more established, so much stronger, so much more powerful 
than they'd been. I mean, did they drive up some salaries in the NFL? Yeah, and for the for the for the NFL players union, it was the greatest thing that ever happened because the guys the guys in the NFL ended up benefiting across the board the players from what happened with the USFL come along, and particularly Donald Trump because he was one of the guys that drove when he stole Sipes and a couple other players away from the you know from the NFL. Uh, it, it did create a salary uh, arms race. And but they were never going to merge. I mean, that was never going to that was never really in the books. And they weren't they didn't need to. But Trump was convinced he was going to force that. And he destroyed the league in the process. I mean, it was amazing what he did. I mean, it was it was a a bad, bad situation that he put that league into. And so I came home from Toronto and told my wife, Susan, I said, you know what? This you remember Donald Trump from New York, Trump Tower? Yeah, yeah. I said, this guy it bought the New Jersey Generals, and she knew that. I said, he's going to ruin the league. He's going to ruin the league. He's going to take him down the primrose path to disaster. I said, mark my words, I'm going to have a chance yet to do arena football. Because I, as I said, I told NBC, I don't see the window there. This has got to be off season. I'm not going to compete with that. I don't. Ha- that's not what I. Ha- that's not my product. But it, the window's not there. And sure enough, in 1985, I'm in Chicago. I, I went to Chicago from Arizona. At the end of the first year, uh, my owner sold. And this Tyler guy that I mentioned to you was out to get me, and I knew it. Tyler was selling, and, and, and I was getting, I had an opportunity to stay with the owner of the Chicago Blitz, who was actually from Phoenix. I'd gotten to know his VP of marketing quite well, and they wanted me to stay in Arizona because they were buying, they bought the, uh, they bought the uh, uh, Wranglers cheap. Because uh, not cheap. They pay actually. I mean, Tyler made not Tyler, but um, Joseph made money at it. But it was a bargain for them because they were losing their butt big time in Chicago. They were bleeding in Chicago, and he just wanted to get out of there and come back to Phoenix. And the only reason he'd ever watch Chicago, his name was uh, Ted Dietrich, a noted heart surgeon from Phoenix. Great guy, incidentally. I would have loved to work with him. Uh, but he was good friends with George Allen. For, he'd known George for years, and George, George. <laughs> Talk about uh, the the storylines behind how things happen. George Allen, the reason the blitz happened in Chicago, and 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 Dietrich got talked into buying the team from his old friend George Allen was George Allen was mad at George Hallis because he hired Mike Ditka to be the head coach instead of him, because he was out on the street. He'd been an assistant coach for George years earlier, and he thought George was going to make him the head coach of the Bears. This was after the Redskins, and George passed on him and took, took Mike instead, and he was infuriated. He decided he was going to get even with George Hallis by putting this great USFL team into Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how that happened. And Dietrich couldn't do a team in Phoenix originally because ASU, Arizona State, would not allow the rental of their stadium for pro football. And not more than two weeks after they consummate the Chicago deal, there is no Arizona team at that point, but uh, uh, a guy that Jim Joseph knew in Phoenix, who uh, Joseph was looking at doing the team, and as Tyler, his CFO, was really pushing it. Joseph said, well, I'd, and Oakland was taken already. In fact, there was a guy that he knew had bought the Oakland Raiders franchise, and that's kind of how they got to Joseph. Uh, and Joseph said, well, I spent some time in Phoenix, and he had some interest in doing some real estate development. He said, why don't we look at that market? We're going to look at anything, or I'm not going to do it. He got a hold of a guy in, in Phoenix who was a friend of his who was a real estate developer who was an ASU graduate, had some connections, donated a lot of money, and he went to him and said, could we use the stadium? And he said, I'll make a substantial donation and we can use it. And they said, okay. <laughs> so the Dietrich was beside himself with this habit as an because he didn't really want to be in Chicago. But they ended up giving him the rights to use the stadium, and that's how we got started late. We were one of the latter teams. And they actually paid me a little bit more money because they knew they were behind the curve and it was a better opportunity for me. My wife wanted to live in Phoenix and that's how I got there. But suffice to say that, that Trump was just running around, you know, causing all these problems. And I knew that the window was going to be there. And sure enough, in 1985, they announced, uh, so I, I, I skipped around. I ended up going to Chicago. 
uh, to run the Chicago Blitz the second year. I left Arizona. The, the new ownership in Chicago had no idea what they're doing. The guy that was help was a consultant that was, help, was helping them put it together. Uh, was a fellow that I knew from minor league football from my days with the Nighthawks, and they were, he had been in the same conference. He actually had had owned and run the Joliet Fire in the league, and had been involved with the Chicago Fire before that in the original World Football League. And he knew me, like me, knew I was, did a pretty good job. And he said, "Hey, would you come in here and, and take this team over?" And so I passed on staying in Arizona, and I went to Chicago. And a lot of people couldn't figure out why I did that, and I couldn't tell them. I knew at the end of year one. After Toronto, when I got back, uh, I said to Susan, this is not, this league is going to go down. I don't want to be in Phoenix if I get a chance to do arena football, it, it, indoor football at that point. I, I, I knew instinctively that I had to get out of there. It wasn't the right place. I either needed to be in New York, and we had at least our house, rented it out at that point back in Darien, or maybe Chicago, because it was in the middle of the country. The league office for the NFL was in Chicago for many, many years until Roselle took over and he was in New York and he moved it, obviously. But suffice to say that uh, I uh, I ended up taking the Chicago job primarily so I could get myself to Chicago uh, to set up for arena football. And plus, I'm from the Midwest. It made sense that O'Hare Airport was there midway. I mean, it was a lot of cheap flights. I was in the middle of the country. I knew I was going to be all over the place traveling. It was the right location, and it worked out well. But and I didn't need to be in New York. I wasn't a major league at that point. I was a, a I was a niche product in in the summer months, and I could do what I needed to do. I had the connections with Hub Arkush at, at Pro Football Weekly. Howard Balzer was in St. Louis. I mean, there were a lot of things. That, and 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 I actually thought to ESPN about it. I called Grimes and said, "Look, I'm in the USFL, but this thing." I, he agreed with me. He said, "Trump." Trump's going to screw it up. He, that was his gut instinct, I think, at the time. He made that comment to that effect. So I said, I'm going to go to Chicago in the USFL with the idea that if USFL doesn't work, I can do arena football from there. And he said, you know what? I think that's a good idea. You don't need to be in New York. So collectively, that's how I got there. So I got to Chicago three weeks before, three weeks before the start of the season. Uh, and, and we ran a very aggressive ad campaign there. We were behind again. I, I put on a, uh, picked up a song called Put Down the Ritz and changed it to Put Down the Blitz. I, we signed, uh, Doug Plank, who would end up being a very good coach in arena football years later. Uh, and, uh, oh, the quarterback from UCLA, uh, Vince Evans, who was a good quarterback. We got both those guys away from Chicago. Uh, and, uh, cause they're in their option years or, you know, they're renegotiating contracts. But we didn't have a lot of, and I did some player personnel work, but the guy I was doing most of it was actually turned out to be very good. His name was uh, uh, Pulliam that went to Indianapolis and uh, Buffalo and then to Indianapolis, Bill Pulliam. And, and the head coach was Marv Levy. But we got started really, really late. So we had good coaching, good player personnel. I put a real strong marketing campaign together only to find out three weeks before the season started that the owner was bankrupting the team because he didn't have any money. He had lied this was a situation where the USFL was so desperate to keep the Chicago in play that when Dietrich was told he had to sell the Chicago team before he could go buy it, before they would approve the Arizona deal his second year, when he knew he could play, when my owner was selling and he knew he could play in Sundell Stadium at home. So he found a heart surgeon. He was a heart surgeon himself, but far better one than this guy. In fact, we found out later this guy had been dinged by the the American Medical Association, whoever keeps an eye on doctors a couple of times for some questionable practices. He did not have a lot of money. He was a second, third tier heart surgeon, but Dietrich knew of him. Dietrich and a guy had an ego that was longer than a city block. He looked exactly like Tim Conway. He talked like Tim Conway. I, the first time I met him, I'm laughing almost. He, he was a dead ringer for Tim Conway. He lied to us and actually told us, this is how big his ego was, I'm digressing a little bit, but he told us that he'd played in the first year of the American Football League uh, for the Denver Broncos. He never did. <laughs> there was no record of him whatsoever. He might have gone through a one-day tryout. But this guy actually ends up buying the team and he and he totally, totally runs it into the ground. He didn't have the money he claimed he had. And we were buying a lot of advertising, putting a very, I mean, very expensive market to put the deal together in. And and uh, and we were really building up ahead of steam to try to get season tickets sold. And it was a tough sell. I mean, it wasn't going to be easy because they George Allen been in the first year with a pretty good team. They're gone. They took the team. Everything went. 
That was part of the deal with Dietrich. He wanted to keep his roster. Uh, so Allen went to, went to Arizona with him, the whole package. And we were trying to start from scratch. Again, we had a great coach in Martin Levy. The pulling was outstanding. Uh, and I had the marketing side of things, and we really had to go to town. And we get bankrupt. He bankrupts the team. The league comes in and literally fires everybody but the football guys and the ticket manager and a, and, a, and a secretary and the whole front office is gone. And I'm like out of work. I need, I, I, I've got a two year contract. I'm getting paid pretty well. I ended up suing the USFL with a guy that would end up being a partner of my arena football, Jerry Kurz, uh, who I knew from minor league football days. He, he played for and ran the Chicago Heights Broncos in the, in the, um, in the Northern States Football League, and they were one of the teams that was supposed to go to Europe with us the first year, but didn't go because at the last minute, his owner got cold feet and pulled out, which he was very happy about. I got a hold of Jerry, and, and Jerry uh, filed uh, subpoenas against all the USFL owners. And one of them was Donald Trump. <laughs> Trump actually got so upset about it, he called me and went over the hell I was when I was suing him. I can't, I can't believe it. this really happened. He may not remember, but he called me. Yeah, somebody called for him and said, are you Jim Foster? And blah, blah, blah. And I said, yeah. He said, Mr. Trump wants to talk to you. He said, what are you suing me for? Why do I get a subpoena for? <laughs> I said, I own a contract. He said, oh, I'll call the league. I'll get it taken care of. And he hung up on me. And you know what? I got my money. <laughs> Well, it sounds like, so in that, in that regard, it sounds like uh, uh, two things happened. So one, you sort of have an inkling in Chicago, obviously, now that and that maybe answers a couple of other questions I had sort of of why uh, some of these test and showcase games in, in the Chicago sort of metropolitan area. Well, it put me it put me back in Chicago. Right. I needed to be in a location I could do this. And I was comfortable with the Midwest. I was close to home. I had some resources. Yeah. You know, I knew people in Chicago. I, you know, I, I mean, it made sense to be in Chicago. And it worked for my wife. She's from outside Chicago, from LaSalle, Peru, Illinois. You know, I just a lot of things fit together. I wanted to keep her, you know, happy and comfortable. Uh, and 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 so I took it. It was a flyer. I I had I, and the guy that the guy that talked me into coming there. He didn't really talk me in, but he reached out to me with a guy by the name of Ron Potosnik, who unfortunately passed away from cancer way too early a few years ago. Uh, it was a good guy that I liked, and 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 I thought, you know, let's let's. And I knew Martin Levy. I knew enough about him. He was a pretty good coach, and I thought, hey, let's do this. But the real reason I did it, and I couldn't tell anybody at the time, anybody, was that I had this idea for arena football, and if I was going to do it, uh, I was going to need to do it in either Chicago or New York. I was very convinced of that, and I think I was right about that. And I really felt that after the involvement of Donald Trump with, and what I saw in Toronto, uh, my gut instinct was this isn't going to get any better for the USFL. I think that, it, I, and I, I was a, a, to this day say the USFL had stayed in the spring summer window they started in where Don, David Dixon positioned them originally. They might still be around. I might not be here. We might not have ever played arena football, quite frankly. Well, and in fact, yeah, I'm sorry. I was go, gonna, well, that is and that. See, that's interesting too because that's another thing that I think is is really revelatory here is that um, you know with, with the demise of the USFL, right? You, you, but having worked in it, you certainly understood the the window that the spring offered the football fan, i.e., yeah. not not in competition with the NFL. Yeah. I never envisioned competition in the NFL. And in fact, I'll jump ahead just a second. When I did start the Arena Football League, as I was in the process of putting it together, I went and met with the NFL. I went back and I told them what I was doing. I did, I, I, I didn't want to, you don't, you don't poke a stick into the sleeping grizzly bear, you know, poke him in the eye, you know, I mean, <laughs> and I went back and said, this is what I'm doing. I'm not, I'm not taking your players. I'm not taking your facilities. I'm playing in a different season. I'm a, I'm a compliment to the game of outdoor pro football. I'm an indoor compliment. I'm a cousin. I'm going to help you. I'm going to probably develop some players that you missed or guys that get cut that maybe in some cases will play for you. But the original positioning of the game physically was these guys to go back. And I talked to a lot of coaches. I had coaches in Bow with experience, both pro and college. Their feeling was, and the NFL felt the same way initially, incidentally, that I, guys I talked to. This is great because it is truly a compliment. You're going to create an opportunity for more guys to play football, and that's a good thing. There's a chance for guys to play 
football out of college that will never play in the NFL. Because your linemen are going to go both ways. They're going to be smaller. They're going to be quicker. You're going to have probably across the board a little smaller, more athletic type of player in some respects. It'll be a quick game. And, and so there, in the beginning, there really was no serious consideration. This is going to be a developmental league for the National Football League. Now, over time, the size of the players in arena football grew substantially, and it really grew to when they made the colossal error, uh, you know, which I'm not going to get into say too much, but, you know, there was a huge philosophical and, 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 and tactical error to go back to playing two platoon football in the arena football league. But there's reasons that happened, and I fought it tooth and nail, but I lost. Uh, and that's changed the game and changed its marketing, too. And there's a lot of people that regret that happened. But there were some coaches – and a few owners and, and a commissioner that, uh, you know, were convinced that it should look more like the NFL, not less like the NFL. That's, that was kind of what drove that. So, and that's just at a time when, the, when we had NFL owners involved. But it wasn't the bulk of the NFL owners. It was a, just a couple. Uh, but at any rate, you know, it was a different game for a different time of the year. And the NFL understood that. They respected that. And, and that while I never had any signed documents with them, I never had any uh, uh, agreements. They said, you know, if you do what you say you're going to do, we're there to support you when we can help. I mean, then we're not going to come out and try to burn you at the stake. That was what I, that's all I wanted to hear. You know, I'm not, you go down your path, I'll go down mine. And if we can help each other, great. You know, and, and I knew enough from being at the NFL. They move slowly. They're very deliberate when they do something. You don't want to get them upset. There's no question that, that the deal with the USFL, the antitrust suit, which the, the USFL won a dollar from, uh, the NFL had such an upper hand with the sports media that I knew that there were good. When I went to Arizona, I was kind of even forewarned to a certain extent. I won't get a lot of details. I just knew that the NFL wasn't the, – the sports media, particularly in NFL markets where, it, where the USFL decided to camp out, and try to make their, their 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 deal go. It wasn't it wasn't going to be that easy. Uh, and not that there was collusion, but Pete Rozelle was a master at understanding how to build loyalty from the sports media. He did a phenomenal job. Uh, you know, I I remember talking to a, a Howard Balzer about it, and even some other guys. Uh, but Howard was the first one who told me about it before Rozelle was commissioner. And this was secondhand from Howard because he wasn't there at the time. But in the old days of the NFL, pre-Roselle, I mean, if you're a sports writer, you got nothing. I mean, they hoped you'd show up for the game. They had rubber hot dogs that were cold, you know, and, and some Coca-Colas and some stale chips up in the press box. But there was nothing done to really entice a writer, uh, as a sports journalist, to come to an NFL game. And they didn't get uh, the coverage that many specs they probably wanted but weren't getting. When Roselle, Rizal, whose background was in – public relations and, and media relations became commissioner. He hit that button right away, man. They, the first super bowl, they, they had briefcases for <laughs> the NFL logo on super bowl logo. I mean, even before that, the fare of food in the press boxes started going up. They reached out to these guys. They, the stats got better. The, the everything got better. Hey, how can we make your job easier? We want you to be here. We wanted to make it worth your while to come do a game to cover it. And he understood that. And he was a master at that. And he built the NFL on two uh, pillars. He built it with much, much better relations with, with the sports uh, journalistic community and then with television. And he was a guy that figured out, and I was told this story early on, Roselle figured out when he became commissioner that you, you know, the typical, you got to remember when you go back to the history of, of the NFL, they were playing at baseball stadiums. They didn't have their own stadiums. I mean, they were playing, they were tenants in, in, in Major League Baseball's ballparks. And the, and the sight lines were terrible. The only, probably the best one was Wrigley Field because it was so small, which is, and I'll sidebar again. I, when, I, when I was trying to figure out where we were going to put arena football in 1987 in Chicago, that was going to be one of the markets. I was looking at the Rosemont Horizon, which we ended up do, working with, and they were a great partner. But along the way, I looked at the old Chicago Amphitheater, which I think has finally been torn down. That was the scene of the 68 the Democratic Convention that went awry. Uh, maybe, you know, I don't know sure. how old you are, but no, I, sure. yeah. I, was in, I was in college when that happened. That was unbelievable. Uh, but I went down there uh, to meet with uh, the people down there, and the guy that was running it, the city had it. He didn't know a lot about whether it was fit or not. 
And he said, get a hold of this guy that just retired. He ran it for years and years. He's been in the stadium and arena business in Chicago forever. I wish I could remember his name. Someday I'll track it down. He lived in a beautiful uh, high-rise apartment on uh, on the point there by Navy Pier. <clears throat> it's a it's a kind of, it was one of the really really tall uh, skyscraper uh, residence uh, Lake Point Lake that, Point Towers. Lake Point Tower, yes. Had a, had a nightclub on the top at one time. I actually went up there in college. I was uh, in Chicago. Ended up being a date for a gal who <laughs> got sick for a sick up fraternity formal. <laughs> I was here for a fraternity convention. I ended up going to Lake Point Tower after their, their they had this, they had the ballroom uh, at the uh, one of the ballrooms at the uh, Conrad Hilton, and then we all went over to the Lake Point Tower. Never been there before. Went up to the top, and Peggy Lee was up there singing in the lounge. <laughs> that was quite a night for me. But he lived in that in that building, and I went up to meet him. He was a really cool guy. But he had actually started out with Wrigley uh, with Wrigley Field. He was there when the Bears came in. That's how old he was. He was retired. He was a cool guy. And he told me, I, he said, how long is your field? And I said, 50 yards. And we're free. He said, yeah, you can get it in the amphitheater. It'll work, blah, blah, blah. And there were some walls and stuff. But he, he knew what he was talking about. He said, this kind of reminds me when the Bears came to Wrigley Field. I said, what do you mean? He said, the field wasn't long enough. <laughs> this is a true story. All the records that were set at Wrigley Field, all the statistics, they never played on a 100-yard field. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. And, and it was never made public. They, when they laid the field out, he was there, and he said it was about two yards short. So George Hallis took a couple links out of the chains, and the, each ten yards was only like about about nine yards, eight inches. I think it was like four inches off or something oh, for that, every ten you yards. Know what, that's really interesting because there was a college game that they played a couple of years ago here at Wrigley. Yeah, they did. And they recognized at some point, well, like almost like the, the day of the game, that there was some kind of short, uh, there was, it wasn't enough room, I guess, either for the, the end zone was too tight and they were worried about player safety. So they literally played it as a half field game uh, so that they wouldn't even go to that end zone. So it's yeah. interesting that well, you mentioned that story that you think that all these years later, they would have remembered that one, but apparently they didn't. Well, it was buried. He said, I, I was sworn by George House never talk about it. I never have. But he says, you know, George is gone now. <laughs> you know, we, we're, you're working on an indoor deal. I doubt it's going to make any difference. But And he said, that's one of the reasons the Ivy, George was the one that grew the Ivy because he wants some cushioning in the end zones. <laughs> in that, Because the, the field ran down the third baseline. As I remember him telling me, I think it was it went to third, it went uh, from home plate to third base. So uh, down third base, and they they ended up short. He didn't want to make the end zones too small because he recognized he wanted to have a large, larger scoring area. So they shortened the hundred yards between the end zones. I actually had to do that with a couple of arenas we went into. I've done it myself. I'm not going to tell you where it was, but I, <laughs> it happened in arena football. And it happened in a building that never shouldn't happen when it happened because they called me when they were building and they wanted the, the layout for arena football and I gave it to them. We never played when I was commissioner, at least, and for the most part in the arena football league till probably now because they, anything goes, uh, with anything but a square corner field. The first year, I, the second year, I passed on putting a team in Miami in the, in the first arena they had down there because it had curved walls the shape of a hockey rink, and they were cement. I also couldn't play in Chicago Stadium because I looked at the stadium, too, and the Chicago Stadium, the old Chicago Stadium, had a fixed wall the shape of a hockey rink, which wasn't there, incidentally, when the Bears played the Portman Spartans in 1937, I think it was, when they went indoors, that was the first indoor football game, a record pro football game. But they played on an 80-yard field. But you know what happened in that game? That's when hash marks were developed because the, they, they put the field in as big as they could put it. And they, the, the sidelines were literally just about up to the – there was a brick wall in the original Chicago Stadium where the seating started at that time, which was later taken out because they, re, re, they went to – the retractable seating and all that became available. So George Hallis realized, and this is where the unbalanced line came from. Have you ever heard that term? The unbalanced line originally in football was, was from rugby. If the ball went out of bounds in the early days of, of American football, they put the ball where it went out. So if it went out on the sideline, that's where you started the play. And they would move the ball in like a couple feet 
just so the guy could snap the ball. So the guy, and that's when they used to side snap the ball sometimes because they were on the sideline and they would literally snap it back to the, the back to the, uh, well, usually it was not the quarter. It wasn't a quarterback back then. It was a spinner back or the half back. He'd take the ball. And when they, when they were going to play the game in Soldier Field or at Soldier Field in, in the uh, Chicago Stadium, Hallis realized that they were going to have a problem with that because the guys were going to be slamming into that brick wall, blocking and tackling if they were along the wall. So he came up with the idea of moving the ball in with a hash mark to get it in a safer position on the field. That's how the hash marks are developed. They never were used in football until that game in Chicago Stadium. And the other thing that happened was that they only played with one end zone because uh, they they because he wanted to have the field as big as he could make it. So the field was 80 yards with one full end zone. So and there was a little runoff, I understand, from what I've been able to read in the other end zone, but not a full end zone. So they put the, to make it as big as they could. They they put the goal post on the on the goal line instead of against the wall at the back of the stadium. That's how the goal post in the NFL got to the goal line for many years. They never were in college, but in the NFL, even when I was a kid, they were on the on the goal line. You you're probably not old enough to remember that. And they actually used to have plays where they'd run a pick using the goal post on pass patterns, and the DBs would run in the. <laughs> they covered a guy and sure. blocked by the goal and, post, and more literally. Than, and more than a few players uh, knocking into those goal posts. But did you ever oh, yeah. did you ever think about or consider uh, the uh, the arena game or the indoor game being solely one way and, and to elongate the field, or was that never a, uh, an option in your mind? No, never did. I went, I went, I never even crossed my, oh, I did, but I, I thought, that's hokey. I never, I, my guiding light and principle from the beginning was, we're going to be as much like the outdoor game as we can be with adjustments made that make sense to play it indoors. Accommodations for indoors. That's why the nets happen. That's why the smaller goalposts. That's why we put the, the foam pad up on the wall. But it, that's why I didn't do things like a, like a, a penalty box. We didn't do, I, I didn't want to do things where people came in and said, this is hokey. This isn't like watching an outdoor game in the sense that the rules were basically the same except change where they had to be and then and one of them would have been fourth down you don't punt you kick instead you try a place kick you know uh and if you make it that's that serves as the field goal uh after you know that's your that's your field or your punt you're gonna you're gonna get rid of the ball kick to the other team but you're gonna do it as a field goal and and, and particularly when i put the nets in play if you if you don't make the field goal guess what it's probably gonna hit the nets and bounce off and, and it's a playable ball so they're gonna return it so i mean i never really wanted to hook it up i never i, I the playing the idea of playing one way i had some other crazy suggestions along the way you know about things we should do that just i said that's not Really, I, I don't want it to be anything but football. And I, and yet I knew there was a rich history of single platoon football. Uh, there were a lot of guys at that time. There aren't as many now because most of them are passing away. Uh, but there were a, a lot of my audience base back then had grown up playing single platoon football, playing both ways. I mean, I was one of them. You know, I mean, that's how I grew until I got to high school. Then it changed. Uh, you know, so I mean, I, I felt like there was nothing wrong with that. And it, and it was a game that I could sell. As a throwback, I could sell it as a, a definite, a different kind of football. We use the name Iron Man football. That was the name on the football. We marketed it that way. And of course, I, I had a little impetus for Iron Man football because if you know anything about Iowa Hawkeye football, the great Val Kinnick, who won the Heisman in 39, played for the, literally the team known as the Iowa Ironmen because they, they had like, 15 guys have played 60 minutes the entire season. They beat Notre Dame. They beat Minnesota, one of the, one of the top teams in the country. Upset uh, Leahy and Notre Dame in a classic battle, six to nothing. Kinnick scored the winning touchdown. Uh, you know, I just, you know, it, uh, you know, I, there was, so I knew, I've always been a historian of, of I was on the State Historical Society board here. I love history, uh, particularly 20th century history. Uh, a lot of, I've always had a lot of interest in the history of sports in this country. And so a lot of those things factored into what I did when I was putting it together. Uh, you know, trying to keep those values, keep tradition, but yet at the same time, do a game with modern nuances. So some things that had never happened before. And, and when we played that game in Rockford, when we had the first kick off the nets, we jury rigged a set of nets. The arena, Doug Logan, to his credit, I give him a lot of credit. Uh, a lot of people along the way that helped me, so many people uh, that, that saw the potential of this thing. Doug Logan had a set of nets built. 
because uh, I couldn't afford it uh, for the first practices that we did. But when I saw the ball come off the nets and the players react to it and how much they thought how cool it was, we, I actually spent most of my life savings to build an actual set of nets, the prototypes that were used for that game in Rockford in, in 1986 in April. And not too far into the game, I still have the game tapes, the originals, uh, this, and I can't remember. Whether, I need to go back and get that stuff dubbed over to, to a viewable format because it's in a format you can't even look I, at anymore. That I could not find on uh, on YouTube. I could not find that test game from uh, April 27th. I've got it. I, it, it I, I think can. a lot of people and find I that to, to be a holy I've got all that like, stuff. I, and I, I've, got, I've even got the test sessions from December of 85. See, what happened was when the USFL announced, and I'm jumping around a bit, but when the USFL announced in the early fall of 1985, they made the big decision. They're going to shut down. They're not going to play the 86 season. They're going to regroup and come back as a fall football league. And Trump had won the battle. He got what he wanted. I called my wife up. I was at work when I heard it. And I called her up and I said, Susan, I got to talk to you when I get home tonight. And I already talked to her about it a little bit before. I said, this is the window I've been waiting for. I have to take advantage of this. The USFL is not going to play. I need to be prepared to know what my game can do. I got to, I got to go for it. I got to put the money together. Got to get it done. And she understood. She's, she's, been, she's uh, talk about the oh, my football widow. My wife might be the candidate of all time in some respects. You know, before her husband says, "Hey, I'm going to reinvent the way we play football in America." That okay, honey? <laughs> but I did it, and. Uh, and she let me do it. She was very supportive. But suffice to say that that was the window right there that I knew I had the season. And and I was at the time. Uh, there's so many side stories and backstories. I and I needed to work after the USFL went down. And I thought, well, I got to go back to marketing. Uh, and you made a comment earlier on about my MBA in, in sports management. You know, I did all those things I did with the Nighthawks and and uh, you, you know and and, I, and and built my resume. Went to Europe in 1976 or seven. I was I was I was doing the Nighthawks. And I was really enjoying what I did, and I knew. Oh, it's actually when I came down here to the. I was contemplating kind of coming to Quad Cities. Wasn't sure I was going to do it. And Susan said to me. I wonder, if, 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 do you think you should get some more education? Do you, do you think you need a, a master's degree? And I said, I don't know. And back then, masters, uh, getting a master's in some cases was not even a good idea because they, you weren't getting paid for it back then. It wasn't as big a deal. I, it hadn't become really the cursory thing it is now. Uh, certainly athletic directors and a lot of people you know, in the in sports business didn't, didn't have them. And now high school guys have got to have them ADs usually. But suffice to say, there was one fledgling sports management marketing program in the country. It was the University of Ohio. I just started it. And I and I found out about it and you know, there was no internet or anything back then, but I, I, I was became aware of it. I called the guy who was running it and his name was Dr. Gilbert, I think was his last name. And we proceeded to have this conversation and I think it was in its second year and he asked me I told him I had been working in sports. He said, Really, what have you been doing? And I and I told him uh, everything I'd done and he said he said, first off, he said, you've created your own internship program for yourself. And I said, well, I guess you could call it that. Because internships weren't even that big of a thing back then. They didn't, they, nothing like they are now. And then he said, you know what? He said, you could come here and teach on the faculty and be more knowledgeable than most of the people that are teaching. <laughs> he said, I don't think you're going to gain anything from coming here. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was kind of funny when you mentioned that. Cause it, so I just went on down the road. You know, I just kept doing what I did. And I taught myself, I guess, as, as they say in the old days, a self apprentice. But, uh, so I, so I, at any rate, I mean, I, I, I had to get going. I had, to, and, but what happened was I, I needed to work, and I went and interviewed with some marketing agencies. And along the way, there was uh, I found out one day the Chicago Sting, major indoor soccer league, and 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 they were in the the old uh, what was the outdoor league that uh, that Pele played yeah, in? Yeah, the NASL, uh, North American Soccer League. Yeah, North American Soccer League, the old NASL. They were in that outdoors. They played at Comiskey Park where the White Sox played, and they were playing indoors. And their focus was really more on the indoor, but they were in both at the time. Uh, at a foot both camps, and which which a lot of those teams didn't do, but they did. They were looking for a, a marketing guy, so 
I went and interviewed with him. I had a good interview. I liked the GM. He's a nice guy. He's from Philadelphia originally, and we would, he would become a very helpful guy in the early stages of arena football, but he had no idea when I interviewed that day that what I had. Well, they couldn't pay me very much money. The problem was their, their, their budget was really low, and the owner was not a, a – again, was one of those guys that didn't really see the value of an aggressive marketing program. But, you know, And that was even true in the NFL. You know, the NFL, when, well, before I got there, they had a rule that you, the teams, and actually when I did get there, this is part of the deal when I went for my interviews, the NFL had a rule that you couldn't market locally. You could sell tickets and sell advertising for the game program. No promotional stuff. Did you know that? And, 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 when, and then they set up NFL charities. And when NFL charities are set up, all they just said, let the league do the marketing and put the money into NFL charities. The old-time owners, the old-school owners in the NFL – didn't see much like college athletics didn't uh, the value of all this. They didn't need this hoity poity, all this fancy promotional stuff. We're not a circus. I mean, we don't need that stuff. We're not a carnival. And I became aware of it when I did my first interview, which I think was with Harry Humes. And Harry told me, he said, you know, we can't really even have an official marketing guy on our staff. Well, that would have been 1973 or 74, somewhere in there. He said uh, uh, maybe 75. Yeah, it was somewhere in that time frame when I and 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 I, I interviewed the Vikings, the Saints, the Redskins, and one other team that's escaping me right now. But but I found out from all three of them they couldn't really have a marketing guy who was putting together full fledged promotions. I could have I would have been selling advertising, and I would have been selling group tickets. That's what I would have been doing. And, and in, in all cases, at that point, they had somebody that was okay, but they wanted, they, but they were nice enough to interview me. And in the case of the Redskins, the GM at the time, uh, Myers was, uh, was a native of Iowa. So he talked to me because I was from Iowa. I probably never would get the interview. Otherwise and I had a good meeting with him. I stayed in touch with him for, for a long time, but, uh, suffice to say that they changed that because of Jerry Jones. That was the way it was till Jerry Jones got involved. Jerry Jones came in and said, what is this all about? All this money's being generated by the league. The teams can't market themselves. Uh, I actually, when I first came in, was assigned to do specific marketing for team projects. And that didn't last very long because they moved me to, na- to, to take over the over- overall national, uh, the whole promotion program. I started doing league stuff. And they didn't really like even having to do it. But in some cases, the, the teams would have something that they felt that could get done. And I was supposed to go in and help them with it, take responsibility for it, because they weren't supposed to really be doing it. I mean, that's how different it was back then. So uh, I was cognizant of that when I started to read a football uh, the USFL had a lot to do with changing that, starting the impetus for it, and stuff that I did in Arizona and stuff that uh, that uh, they did in Orlando and a couple of the other teams really rocked some boats with certain NFL owners and certain people in the NFL that we maybe we should be doing more of that type of thing. They didn't want to do it because baseball was doing it. That was the real reason for it. They they saw, and some of that was George Howe, some of it was uh, the Maras in New York, some of them just decided that they didn't need to do that. We're selling the, as that was put to me, the pure sport of football. We don't need to be like baseball. People don't go to baseball games to watch baseball like they do to go to football, you know, that old concept. And there's some truth in that, quite frankly. I, I was watching the World Series this year, and the guy was doing the color for the, the series. I don't, I'm sure you probably watched it. But I was watching it on network television. Uh, and I forget who that was. I should know his name. Made the comment twice during the series games. He says, you know, this is really tough for these guys tonight. There's a lot of pressure on because this is a this is a game that counts. This is a World Series game. You know, during the season, it's not nearly. You know, there's not much pressure. Did, did you did you hear him say that? Did you listen to the game? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. That? Yeah. I mean, that that I'm thinking the commissioner of baseball is going. God, why did he say that? I mean, but the reality of it is, they play so many games, and some of those games, hey, you lost today, so well, we move on, we play another one. It's not that way in pro football. It's not that way in college football, particularly at maybe at Lake Forest College, it's that way. But you know, uh, some of those you know lower level you know uh, leagues where it's just really more for fun. But when you're when you're playing in a power five conference, <laughs> there's not another day. You know, I mean, believe me, after Ohio State got beat by Iowa, where we blew them out, and then Iowa turns around and loses to Wisconsin with 55 yards of you know. The total offense. I mean, this was like the Titanic going down for the Hawkeyes a week ago. You know, I mean, how could this happen? You know, I mean, oh, geez. But so I'm dealing with a lot of those nuances as I'm 
starting to go into putting this thing together. And so we went out to, we, you know, we ended up going out to Rockford and Doug Logan, you know, was, I'm, I'm jumped ahead a little D- Doug Verb was the general manager of the sting. So I ended up passing on the job. I couldn't afford to work for him. And, and, I, and I was honest with him. He understood that. I ended up getting hired by Burke Marketing, which was a large promotional marketing agency in the city at that time. They also were the publishers of Outdoor Magazine, which are outside or outdoor Cuspin lineup. It's still around. In fact, they spun off the a marketing agency many years ago and just focused on it because the guy that was the, the father had started the marketing agency and been very successful with the son came along was more interested in the magazine side and eventually after his dad died sold off the, the marketing side the agency side but that's what i went to work for and when i interviewed with them they liked the fact that i had sports marketing background they weren't quite sure what they would do with it but the, one of the guys i was going to work for felt that there might be some opportunities maybe in Chicago with maybe colleges or something to maybe open some doors to sports marketing. And and he was a little ahead of his time, but he was right. And so after I got the job, I get a call one day from Doug Verb, the GM of the Sting. He said, I was just trying to see what happened with you. And I said, well, I'm working for Burke Marketing. Uh, And he knew who they were. And he said, uh, would they be interested in maybe talking to us about doing some marketing with you doing it? And that's what happened. I ended up becoming the promotion manager of the Chicago Sting via Burke Marketing. And I was working on my first big account was Timberland Boots and Shoes. And I was working on some stuff for Timberland. And I, 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 this is a honestly true story. The, the second day there when I was working, going through all the documentation on Timberland, it hit me. I go, what am I doing here? marketing boots <laughs> and they were a good product. There was nothing wrong with it. I marketed Maytag washers, dryers, a great product for, you know, when I came out of college, that's what I did. And I, and I love that job. I, it was a great experience working in a corporate environment. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur all the way, but I needed that discipline, but I'm sitting there. I still remember looking out the window of my office on rush street down below at the corner of Clark and rush and thinking, God, I got to make some big adjustments here. <laughs> and two days later, there must have been mental telepathy. That's when the uh, verb calls and says, could you guys be interested in doing it? So we set up a meeting with him. We go meet with him. It was perfect because the guy that brought me in in part because he thought I might have the ability to start some sport marketing. He saw it. He said, we got to do this. We put a deal together. It started out that I was only going to work on it part time. And then as it got bigger, uh, verb said to him, we really need Jim focused on this. I ended up, my entire job was working, doing the marketing for this thing. And we did some really cool stuff. And it really helped me because now I'm working in the arena business. I'm inside. I'm working in that environment. And it just opened my my mind to different things I could deal with. Which gets me to back to Doug Logan and the game in, in Rockford. How it happened was, I'm having lunch with Verb one day. And he says something similar to Howard Balzer years earlier in Canton, Ohio. He said, you know, because uh, I was asking him, I, 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 I informally prompted it, him to think, bring this up. I'm talking to him about the background in indoor soccer. And I said, you know, if I was if I was inventing indoor soccer, and I literally said this to him with him not knowing anything about arena football, I said, if I was inventing arena football right now, or indoor soccer, I would make the game more uh, tailored to the American psyche. And he said, well, what do you mean by that? I said, the thing that bothers me when I watch an indoor soccer game, it's fast. There's a lot of action. I like it better than the outdoor game. I like everything about it, but, and he, and and remember, I watched the first time I ever watched indoor soccer, I'm designing a football. So here I'm sitting here now (laughs) working in indoor soccer, telling them how I would design it. And I said, I would put Rugby shoulder type, rugby type shoulder pads on these guys. I would let them board check. I would, I would not get carried away with all the hockey gear or a true football uniform, but I would put shoulder pads on enough that they could board check and make it more of an American physical game and perhaps allow them not without, and I didn't want to make it into handball because I knew a little bit about that from watching an Olympics television one time, but maybe they could physically catch the ball on the run. Uh, and either kick it within two steps or they score with it. If they're going, you know, close enough to the goal line, they could, they could drive it in with, they could, they could throw it in. And he said, Oh God, those are some, he liked the ideas. He said, boy, I don't know though. He said, some of these soccer guys. So, okay. so, but out of that 
comes this conversation about, well, maybe someday somebody will have a hybrid sport like that. And he said, it would really be interesting to see how he, he said, he says, I want, you could almost like do a cross of soccer and football indoors to which I said to him, I had my briefcase. I pull out a disclosure letter and said, in the form and said, sign this dog. I got something I got to tell you. <laughs> and so I took him through it. He was wowed by it. He got involved with me. And this was a lot of my, a lot of my early success and ability to go forward was because of people like, Doug and others that came along, Doug Logan as well. He knew Doug Logan. He calls Doug Logan up because they'd done some practice games up there because they had a turf up there. They'd actually given him a turf and they played a couple preseason games up there. They had an, old, an extra turf up there. He calls Doug and said, I want to bring a guy out. You need to meet him. And I, so I had to make Logan sign this disclosure and I explained it to him. And, and Doug's idea was that we could use that to, because I told him we needed to fine tune the rules. I said, I'm not going to, to a league unless I know it works. He said, I got just a place. It's 85 miles from Chicago to Rockford. So we go out there, we meet with Logan. Logan said, I love it. This is a great concept. He said, yeah, we can work something out. We'll put the field down. Uh, we can figure something out. So fast forward, we're going to do the, the, the practices in December to test the game. And this is where the rubber met the road for me. I had butterflies. I was almost sick a couple of times. I was so worried because I was – is this really going to work? I mean, it, we're getting down to the nitty gritty and, and Burke didn't know anything about it at that point yet, but we went up there for a Friday night, Saturday sessions uh, in the Sunday at need be. And I rented some hotel rooms. We rounded up players that had played in the, in the league that I played in and ran my teams in uh, the Northern States football league. We got play and I went back to some coaches and I knew and stuff and, and I, and I had to make all these guys sign disclosure letters. I asked them to come to Rockford on a, on a uh, no, I take that back. We started Saturday morning early. We were going to do Friday. I didn't want to have to deal with Friday evening. So we brought them in early Saturday morning. We sat them all down. They didn't know why they were there. It was an opportunity to potentially play pro football. That's all they knew. And it was going to be just, we're going to do this meeting in Rockford. So they came there. And I proceeded to tell, I made all these players, all these, these coaches are involved, volunteers, guys are going to help with this sign all this paperwork and just these one pagers that they would never tell about what they were doing. And if they did, I found out they would never get a chance that this was a league and they bought into it, believe it or not, you know, <laughs> this guy's from the Midwest <laughs> and most of them were small college players that played in this league. But suffice to say that we went about, we had equipment. I was able to borrow equipment from a couple of teams in the league. I've been involved with you know, And so again, I had these resources in the Midwest. I would have to spend a lot more money if I had not been there. If I'd been in New York, I hate to think. So I was able to borrow uniforms. We suited them up. I cut a deal with a guy uh, named Bob Carzola, who's still in Chicago, has produced a lot of sports film over the years, and actually, among other things at the time, was doing the first replay board operations for the Rosemont Horizon when they put their first board in all those years ago. And Bob still does that on, on the side. He's, he's, he's done a lot more than that. But So Bob brings out his production truck, and they videotaped from three different angles what we were doing on the field, everything we did. We tested eight nine and 10, excuse me, seven, eight, nine, man, four mats. Seven looked like flag football. Did not like it at all when we reviewed it, even from that day sitting up in the stands watching, uh, you know, and then eight looked pretty good. The balance looked good. Nine was the best. I looked at nine and said, this looks like an outdoor game. You really can't tell the difference. The only problem was a couple of coaches said it may make the passing lanes pretty crowded. We may not be able to throw the football that well. The interesting fly in the ointment there, though, was at the time was that we were running out of a pro set, an I set. We were using a two back set. Uh, and I had not yet hired Mouse Davis later on, who would bring the run and shoot to arena football. But what Mouse did with the game and some changes he made, we could have probably played with nine guys and we could have had a real tight end. But we didn't know that at the time. You know, it's, it's history at this point. But it, it was it, so we went through all these different permeations and, you know, variations of would it work, would it not. But when we got, when I, I picked Ray Yock up at the airport the night before he came in from, uh, he was living, I think he was back, he was still living in DC and, uh, he flew out, pick him up and we go up to Rockford and had a hotel up there, uh, for the night. And he, we decided to go by the arena to see, cause I wanted to see where they were at. I wasn't even sure they'd have it set up yet. 
I walk in and we're up on a, uh, uh, you walk in on the main level and you're looking down on the field, the, the main bowl is in front of us. They had just the house lights on, just some security lighting. So the field was lit, but kind of half dimly. It was breathtaking. It was like seeing your first child born, <laughs> maybe even better. I mean, it was, they had taken tape and I didn't even think we were going to have yard lines. I asked if we could have a couple yard lines just to line up on so we could have a straight line of scrimmage. They had put the entire 50 yard field down with the eight, with the eight yard end zones with tape. And it was, it, it was good gaffer's tape as they call it. It stuck. I mean, it didn't go anywhere. And Doug had on his own built based on my special, he asked me what the specifications what the nets would look like. I had no idea he was going to do this because I didn't think we were going to have any nets the first time. I couldn't afford it. I didn't think. He built a set of nets out of the Rhone Tower and stuff they use for concerts and cobbled together a workable set of nets. And it was, it took my breath away. I had tears in my eyes. And Ray's like, you're getting a little emotional. I hadn't seen Ray for a few years. He goes, I said, yeah, Ray, I mean, this is, he says, yeah, it looks pretty cool. But then he about broke my heart. He goes, I'll never forget this. If, there, if, they, ever, if they ever do a movie, this will be one of the great lines in the movie. Ray looks at me and says, you know what, Jim? It looks like a postage stamp. I don't know how the hell you're going to play football on it. <laughs> my heart stopped. I'm not kidding. I went, oh, my God. I had invested three or $4,000 already at this point. What money I had, which is probably 10000 total, with most of it to go just on that test session and on a game in the following April to build the real set of nets. That cost me four grand, five grand. Uh, my wife was not happy when she found that out, but they, they worked great. But at any rate, that was the how we got to that point. And the first day of practice, halfway through it, the first session, I think we started on the field like 9 to 10 and then took a short break and then went till 12. Ray looks over at me and says, a big smile on his face, and he goes, you know what? It may be a postage stamp, but this is really cool. You can do some neat things down here. <laughs> Okay, that's a uh, uh, an interesting place to uh, push the TiVo pause button. Uh, and we're going to continue this conversation with Jim in uh, next week's episode. Uh, we're kind of just scratching the surface uh, sort of at the beginning days uh, of the Arena Football League. I thought it was interesting, though, to, uh, to get into some of that backdrop because uh, while you heard some of the AFL's um, Arena Football League's uh, uh, story uh, interspersed there in what Jim was uh, discussing, uh, I think the backdrop, the early uh, uh, progeny, I guess, of the idea uh, was uh, is, is also very, very important. Obviously, his days in uh, Iowa semi-pro football, certainly uh, his uh, days in the uh, National Football League, uh, his inspiration at the major indoor soccer league all-star game in 1981 at Madison Square Garden, a game that I was at, by the way, uh, just a kismet for whatever it's worth, the 13,000 or so other fans that were there, too. Uh, but that was obviously a seminal moment in the history and the birth of, uh, of arena football as an idea. And uh, clearly, too, uh, Jim Foster's uh, uh, experience in the USFL as a, uh, sort of evidence that uh, there is an appetite for professional football uh, in the spring. Uh, we might want to get into that uh, story about uh, his reminiscences, I guess, of uh, a young and brash Donald Trump and uh, his sort of uh, shenanigans, I guess, behind uh, maybe the decline uh, and then the uh, the demise of the USFL. Uh, that's av- obviously a topic that we're going to get into much more uh, on other discuss in other discussions. But uh, hopefully, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that with Jim in our next conversation. So stay tuned. Next week will be part two uh, of our interview with uh, Arena League founder uh, Jim Foster. So we uh, look forward to that, and we encourage you to listen uh, and set your pod catchers. Uh, to that episode again next week for part two with Jim Foster. Um, let's see. Okay, we want to uh, thank, of course, sportshistorycollectibles.com. Use your promo code GOODSEATS for 15% off. Uh, we want to thank Audible again for uh, their kind sponsorship. Again, you want to go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats for your free 30-day trial and uh, your free um, uh, audiobook download. Again, lots of titles to choose from. And of course, we want to thank our friends at Podfly Productions, in particular, Mr. Jerry Payne, uh, for all of their production uh, goodness. And again, that's podfly.net. If you've got a podcast idea, you're itching to get going, but just don't know where to start, Podfly Productions is the place to go. That's Podfly. 
GoodSeatsStill.net. My name is Tim Hanlon. Thank you for listening. Uh, follow us on Twitter at GoodSeatsStill. Uh, you'll find us on uh, Instagram at GoodSeatsStillAvailable. Uh, on Facebook, there's a page devoted to us at Good Seats Still Available. Find us there. And if you can't remember any of that, just go to our website, GoodSeatsStillAvailable.com. You'll find our email address and all the other good stuff there, all the past episodes. Check us out there early enough on GoodSeatsStillAvailable.com. And uh, thank you for doing so. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week with our part two with the uh, interview with Jim Foster. And uh, again, as always, my appreciation for listening. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week.